There we go. That's better. Already. Yeah. So yeah, welcome to another fireside chat without the fireside across the pond. I can put on a fireplace screensaver if that makes everyone feel better. <laughs> That'd be the sort of thing LGR would do. Here's my fireplace screensaver. I was watching a really terrifying, terrifying video it, um, that he's, he's done. I don't know how old it was, but it was like the computer game version of Freddy Got Fingered, the animated yeah. bits. It was just unwatchable. It was like, wow, you own this. And he had it in a special case. This is a, he had a big pelican case for this game box. You know, it's just in case somebody comes in and plays it by accident. Mm. It's not okay. It's not okay. It was awful. But yeah, if you're very bored, go and watch LGR because it it, it falls neatly into the um, Sigidio, the shit I'm glad I don't own <laughs> philosophy that I'll be talking about on the Rangers TV show. It's, it's, is that that it's lazy my... game reviews that we yeah about? oh okay, it's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, but he goes thrift shopping, which saves you going to thrift stores and buying useless shit. And he's just like, "Oh, thank you for doing that." It's it's like all the excitement of going to various thrift stores without the drive in between, and without the bringing tons of useless crap home. And if you notice with these with these guys that do this review of obsolete tech, they're now having to do videos on stuff people have sent them. <laughs> Which means that people are just getting crap out of their houses going, no, I don't need that. It's weird, and I would show it to someone, but if I send it to this guy, not only do I not have to show it to people, but I can also say, oh, I sent that in. So I don't have to buy a Tiger Gamecom. No. (laughs) Just so I can play Duke Nukem 3D in black and white. Yeah. No, buy yourself a Raspberry (laughs) Pi. Emulate the shit out of it. Yeah. And just go, no. I've got a tiny little box. If I really feel the urge to play every last Nintendo game, it's there. And I'm telling you, when the reality's there with you and you haven't purchased it and you're just in it for the gameplay, they are crappy. <laughs> you know, just there's not a patch on modern games or anything like that. I mean, the gameplay, some of it. There's a couple of games. F-Zero, I don't think, has ever been bettered as a pick-up and just play for 10 minutes racing game. Mm-hmm. That's probably one of the finest racing games, just purely because of the console response. The graphics are dirt, you know, they're rubbish. But yeah. the gameplay is awesome. And um, as far as the the Genesis goes, or the Mega Drive, if you're in the UK, it'd have to be something like Road Rash. <laughs> it's super fun to play because it's like bike bike racing with violence. <clears throat> and But you only really want to play it for 10 minutes. You see a little bit of when people do the I've got every Nintendo game ever and they get interviewed on YouTube. Yeah. There's, you can see in their eyes there's a little bit of dead. <laughs> so there's a little bit of looking into the camera and going, somebody help me. For God's <laughs> sake, help stop me. Stop me. Take me out for a drink. Please take me and do something social. Anything. I'll go to a train <laughs> spotters convention. This is sick and sad and I need to be cured. This is my cry for help. Look at my wall of video games that are obsolete. Here's my weird. Here's my whole shelf full of unreleased Japanese Nintendo games. No, just you know, just need to go round and have an intervention. What was that like? Super rare game. It's like some kind of track and field game. It's like why? Why did I just spend the one hundreds hundreds of dollars for that? It's on a gold (laughs) cartridge or some shit like that. You're just like, no, (laughs) no, stop. I'm wasting my life. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, I know we are with kind of weird gear and stuff, but I have to say, if you totted up all the weekends away I've had while camping and, and having a really, you know, physically miserable but interesting time, that's all paid for itself. Yeah. Because I, I refuse to buy the $2,000 knife. Yeah. There's a limit on a sliver of metal. You know, <laughs> there's, there's an absolute end point. We've got a shop over here called Henny Haynes, and it has just almost all the most ridiculously expensive tactical and folding knives and shit like that. And they send me an email about once a month to tell me what I don't want to buy. All right, no, no, no. I just lose knives too often and pay that much for them. Yeah, I've never lost my um, found even, but I took major steps to never lose it i mean it's it's dummy corded to the sheath for one yeah with a with a dog lead clip and it's got a little um one of those little uh what's that radioactive stuff in watches 
tritium. tritium. It's got a little yeah. tritium bead on it, so I can't even lose it in the dark. Oh, that's cool. And it's on a belt <clears> hanger. <throat> it's the most secured knife because it is. It's just a great knife. It's just unfortunately now they're really expensive. Nobody knew about them when I bought it, <laughs> and I bought it because the guy who reviewed it had had it for like five years. Yeah, it just abused the shit out of it for five years. You know, going, I'll break it at some point, and then I'll be able to say it's shit. And he had, he didn't manage it. Even the guy that does the destruction knife reviews hasn't broken one. And it's just like <laughs> I clearly need this knife. This yeah. is this is my, this is the knife made for me. I'm clumsy. I can't have nice things. I, I need things I can throw off mountains and go and get. So yeah, yeah I've I've never lost the found even knife. I've given away more knives than I've lost because I bought a shed load of the um, super cheap Mora ones. Yeah. And just gave them to people that looked at me like they were gonna. Their next words were gonna be, "Can I borrow your knife?" Here, yeah, those ha- are great for gifts. Have a knife. There you go. <laughs> oh, I don't know how to thank you. It was two pounds fifty. It's worth <laughs> two pounds fifty f- to me for you not to use my knife. <laughs> yeah, that's a bargain. It's worth two pounds fifty to me for you not to nick my knife and just put a little dink in it, and then me spend two hours trying to get the dink back out of it with a, fi- a sharpening stone true you know i i rate my 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 life my my spare time at around five dollars an hour you know if i would choose to do this thing if mm-hmm. i can pay five dollars an hour and not have to do that thing that's a bargain in my in my book so the, the those the more of viking which is a red handle knife it's exactly the same as the more bushcraft knives it's just got a slightly different handle same blade everything but they were like three bucks each Mm-hmm. And I must have bought about a dozen of them and just given them to people over the years and just I've got one left. And I just gave them away. It just stops stops people having a bit of a knife moment when they don't know anything about knives. Here, it's razor fucking sharp. Yeah. If you cut yourself, it will go straight down to the bone. It's Scandinavian <laughs> grind steel. It's new, it's sharp as fuck. You're literally <laughs> holding a giant razor blade. Treat it yeah. like that. You know, it's really sharp. Then five seconds later, I've cut myself. That's why I bring plasters. <laughs> I knew yeah. you'd do that. And if I told you, I know you're going to cut yourself. You'd have looked at me like I was being patronizing. So I didn't. I knew you were going to cut yourself. That's why when you started to fuck around with it, I actually got the first aid kit out and just watched you. Like, <laughs> as you came over to tell me you cut yourself, I was handing you the Band-Aid. Because I knew for a fact you would have to fuck around. Because I have to. Whenever I get a new knife, I dick around with it until I cut myself. And then it's like, okay, that's my dicking around period with this knife. I'm done now. I can put it away. Um, It's tasted my blood. It's tasted my... It's mine now. I can't ever return it. It's contaminated by me. It's mine. I've I've peed in its metaphorical corner. I own it. Yep. I love those Ganzo knives as well because it lets you play with the knife shape of something much more expensive. And then you very quickly learn that you don't want one. You don't want the expensive (laughs) version. That's $10. Yeah, okay. No, I don't want one. I'll use it to open packages and shit, but yeah. I I now know that I don't want it. Yeah. There's a lot of people on knife forums kicking off about those Ganzo knives. You should buy American. Hmm. They're made in China. You should buy a a proper Spyderco made in taiwan it's like they don't make them in america if they made them in america i I might feel a bit bad about it right you know yeah but the reason ganzo can make those knives is because the ganzo factory is where they make those knives (laughs) you know the becca bk ones and the and the spider co's and all that and all the sort of like you know the wrap knives and the folding all the all those american brand folding knives are all made in the same factory and just one company went, look, just make me a shitload of those, but don't fuck around with all the weird steels. Just make it in 440C. Yeah. Which is just as good. It's a, still a nice piece of steel. All the fixtures and fittings are exactly the same. And they'll change one aspect of it to make it like sort of legal in America and charge you a tenth of the price. Do you want to play with a Spyderco paramilitary? Love to. I don't want the person that's, that owns it looking at me, wondering when I'm going to cut myself on it. I'd rather have my own, but I don't want to spend $150. Oh, uh, speaking of that, um, I uh, I got a pretty good deal on, uh, well, hmm. Okay, I got to introduce this a little bit. So, <clears throat> um, 
unless if you haven't noticed and you've been living under a rock, we've had a bunch of shootings here in the U.S. And unfortunately, every time there's a shooting in the U.S., there's a bunch of people that start talking about gun bans. And one of the you know big things on the <laughs> list is always quote unquote high capacity magazines. Yeah. So like pretty much everything over 10 rounds. So about every 10 years, actually. Yeah. Um, there's a sudden ban on it. And then the individual states like release it and just go, no, it's fuck all this. It doesn't make any difference. Yeah. So um, I went to find um, larger capacity magazines for the uh, M1 carbine that we have. <clears throat> and the reason why I didn't do that to begin with when I first got it. I mean, I, I, I got a bunch of uh, 15 rounders, but the reason why I didn't buy the 30 rounders is because I'd, I'd seen online that perhaps it needed another uh, mag catch to be able to run those. Yeah. And so I didn't really want to mess with modifying the gun at this point because I had other guns that I needed to to uh, customize first before I spent the money on that one. So um, I just bought a bunch of 15 rounders and now I've gotten around to buying the 30 rounders because I figured, Hey, if they're going to do another magazine ban, these are going to be impossible to find because pretty much only one manufacturer makes decent ones. There's, there's some Korean copies, but these are the only ones that are made in the United States. So I was like, okay, I'll buy a bunch of those. So I did that. And while I was shopping on that site, um, I saw the uh, the British um, Other Arms Bergen and the, uh, the oh crap I'm gonna forget what it is um, the the other large Bergen that you guys have that's like 120 liters including oh, the, the standard, side rocket patches yeah yeah the standard PLC yeah, yeah. so. Um, I got what I feel is like a pretty smoking deal on those packs. Um, and so, and, and the other arms Bergen, I couldn't find anywhere like, mm. like, uh, you know, like, uh, Sean Kennedy says it's, it's like unicorn gear, you know, yeah. it's, it's very difficult to find. The, so the SA, you mean the SAS clamshell rock? Yeah. Whatever that he we calls it. We couldn't find for two years until somebody in the military went, that's another arms Bergen. Yeah, you type in other arms Bergen. There's fucking hundreds of them. It's like exactly, oh, yeah, you bastard, right? It's because yeah, he gave the wrong, now. yeah, because he gave the wrong name of it. He he, you know, had Wog searching for it for years. But anyways, <laughs> <laughs> but anyways, um, yeah. So, um, you know, and the first the first person I ever saw who had one was uh was Hatter of Madness. I, I did a video about it on Storm and Wire, but. Um, yeah, so I decided to get that and I needed a new backpack for work anyway, because coming into winter, I'm going to be carrying a lot of more winter gear. I'm going to have to be carting back and forth a lot more stuff mm -hmm. to work. And, uh, and the backpack that I have now, um, for work was something I got that was super cheap copy. Like it was, I mean, it's, I don't even know if it would be suitable for airsoft. It's, it's crap. It's, it's junk. Like the zipper split on me within a few months. So, um, I got the, uh, other arms Bergen to replace that. So, Oh, the other arms Bergen just dynamite. Yeah. I've, I like them so much. I bought one for, um, my best mate in the UK. I just gave it to him and just said, look, have this. They're just fucking brilliant. Um, I had one stolen and I managed to get another one, but I've, for the last 10 years, I've had them and I even mm -hmm. took, uh, I even took the other arms Bergen on the Hadrian's wall walk. Oh, okay. And it was just phenomenal. It just <clears throat> stood up to it. It's not the most comfortable, you know, really hiking long distances because the waist belt isn't all that great. Yeah. You can, get, you can get a hip pad for it. That's the downside of the British Army ones. They expect you to then go and buy the hip pad, which mm. I'd recommend because mm -hmm. it will make it a lot more comfortable. But they are bomb proof. You know, yeah. the zips are just fantastic. You know, the everything's just great. It is just one big bag <laughs> to just put all your shit in. What I've done is, and 
might be a tip for you is that if you get one you know those um they it's it's like a kind of a fashionable shape there's like the max expedition shaped rucksacks where you've mm. got like the two m- main compartments and then two little they look like extra pockets on the outside covered mm. in molly webbing and if yeah. you look on ebay they're like sort of like you look at them and you think that's going to be crap it's like eight quid for mm-hmm. a 20 liter one Mm-hmm. But what I've done is, and it really works when you're going out in the woods, is if you put on the All Arms Bergen and you put all the little crap, all the stuff that goes floating around and missing in your Bergen in one of these little tiny rucksacks, mm-hmm. that's like 18 litres or something really puny, but all your cooking kit, all your wash kit, all your knives, radios, torches, everything in the little tiny rucksack and then put that in the all arms Bergen as an organizer. Mm. Cause for eight, eight, eight or $9 for a, for a rucksack organizer that they don't make. I mean, you can't get, you can't add extra pockets to the all arms Bergen, mm. but right. you can put this thing in and then all your sleeping kit, like your hammock, tarp, sleeping bag, all the bulky shit, your jacket and stuff fit that all around it. And then when you get to your camp, you set up all your stuff. So all the bulky stuff that was in the Bergen is now up. All your carabiners, all your all your bungees, all your lines, your whole shelter system's up. Your sleeping bag and your pack mat are all in in the hammock. Everything's all set up. So your all arms Bergen is empty apart from this one bag that you can pull out. So your organization, all your stuff that you need to sort of police while you're in camp, because it's a good idea to put everything away before you go to bed. Yeah. Just in case you have to move but also so you can find it in the morning without faffing about. That all goes in the little tiny rucksack. It also mm-hmm. means that if you had to bail, I mean, obviously you'd have you'd probably have firearms, but if you had to bail really quick and you didn't have time to take down your stuff, all your survival equipment, all your sort of like, you know, emergency gear, first aid kit, foil blankets, paracord, everything that you'd have other than your shelter system and your sleep system is all in one little bag. Yeah. So you, you can rab it if you need to. Or you can at least temporarily rab it. I mean, in your case, it'd probably be things like ammunition, fishing kit, stuff like that. But all those little bits and bobs that would be rattling around in the bottom of the Bergen just literally fit in that bag. It has saved me so much time. Oh, yeah, they also that's, make that's good, definitely a good idea. Good camera yeah. bags, but it's such a cheap way of doing it. I mean, if you tried to buy like a rucksack organizer or a series of little bags... It would still cost you more than about $8. Mm-hmm. But it also means that your core gear, if you wanted a car bag or a, like a backup to your work bag, you could just have that. And then when you yeah. go to go camping, you just slot it into the big Bergen and you're away. All that stuff that you don't really want to leave behind is in this one tiny rucksack that you don't really want to wear because it's yeah. stupid. They they look like, you know, it's it feels like size wise when she'd been wearing the all arms burgundy you put on the little pack to go somewhere it feels like <laughs> you're wearing one of those stupid teddy bear rucksacks you see teenagers <laughs> with. it feels minuscule on your back yeah it is, it's all those stupid little things that well i otherwise... do have a uh a kafaru um e and e which is uh almost 13 liters it's 785 cubic yeah, inches so so that I... yeah use that yeah because I, I i haven't really found uh, a use for it um so i can i can use it for that so, so. And I've, got, I've got one of those satellite tactical bags that kevin is a geek gave me because he hated it it's like a it's like an oblong bag it's like a it's about six inches by six inches by 35 inches oh so, yeah just like i it. think i think he had that on the trip uh when he came to my place yeah they're awful, but the thing about that is, it, is it really nicely fixes to the top of the All Arms Bergen. So mm-hmm. if I'm taking my tripod and other camera accessories, all that goes in a separate bag. Mm-hmm. And it just sits on top of the thing. And also, the other good thing about the Other Arms Bergen, if you buy the Czech Army sleeping bag, which is in the cold weather a really nice addition, that will actually sit on top of it when it's fully packed. Because the all arms you, you can to... attach the rocket pouches to those, can't you? Mm. Yeah. Okay. Because I yeah. do have probably an extra set of those that I could put on there too. Oh, or just zip on. Yeah. <clears throat> it was probably the last time the British Army went completely modular and just said, "Don't want to think about it. Everything should be interchangeable." 
but it's the ab- absolutely it's a great rucksack and it's designed to go through airports and it's because des- it's got that flap that rolls down that covers up the straps and it's, it's mm-hmm. the velcro is really good so it really does its job and is largely waterproof i mean i was out in terrible terrible rain and my my pack and my or the inside of my bag did not get wet i was out in the really the worst kind of weather you can imagine when i was walking adrian's wall and everything stayed dry mm-hmm. um but it is just phenomenal, but it's the anti SAS rack because it is for literally things like army clerks or clerks. Mm-hmm. It's for supply clerks. It's for people. It's HR guys. It's it's people that you know mechanics and stuff. People that aren't frontline troops. It's like the 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 anti frontline rucksack, but it is so good because it's yeah. indestructible. Because the British Army really hate giving you a second one of anything. <laughs> you know they expect to give you a bag and then your bag to look exactly the same for the next 10 years and because because of that if you're in the uk or you're somewhere where you can get to it or you do find one in america they're generally in really good condition because what it's done is sat in a locker for like 10 years or, or how yeah. long the guy was the guy was there they don't get deployed you'll never it also find had the, the forward the great base. um the great military surplus smell yeah <laughs> you know like when you when you get just get something from a military surplus store and oh, it's also, got that it's got that funk to it i mean it's yeah. i love it i love it i don't i don't know why <laughs> but also if you ever use a laundromat um it will actually hold a large uh, machine's worth of clothes mm-hmm. literally if you go to the large machine in most because most laundromats have got different sizes of washing machine You've yeah. got two or three different sizes and if you jam it full of laundry, you can actually just tip that into one of the large machines. Mm-hmm. It's like all of that, like super compressed laundry. You know, like it, it's an it's an amazing amount. It's about two weeks worth of laundry. Yeah, it'll take. And then you can just empty out the whole rucksack. People give you funny looks in laundromats when you come in with a giant rucksack full of stuff and you just <laughs> pile it into the machine. But I, I promise you, it will all fit into a large machine in a laundromat. Because it was my laundry bag for such a long time, because it's indestructible and it's quite comfortable, and just like heave it all on the back. And it's right, I'm going to the laundromat, you know, with all my clothes, every piece of clothing I wear, and in fact, the stuff I'm wearing now should really be in the, you know, I should, <laughs> I should pull a Levi five hundred one ad and just like literally strip down to my boxes and just put everything in, but I, I can't really do that. But yeah, it's that <clears throat> that bag that that particular model of bag has lived with me for about fifteen years. So good review. So I, so I should yeah. expect good things from it. Mm-hmm. I mean, check it out. Make sure there's no stitching going on it or anything like that. Mm-hmm. It sounds like you've already had a look over it. If there's nothing yeah. obviously broken on it, nothing will break on it. The only times I've ever had anything wrong with it is when it's been wrong when I've got it. Yeah, I've never actually managed to break anything on the bag. And I am clumsy and careless <sighs> with my kit. I should be a review person people should just send me stuff and this guy's going to treat our, our stuff like shit he's going to drop it he's going to let it leave it out in the rain he's going to forget about it kick it over nearly set fire to it a few times you know it's like really i'm the worst you could never give me anything that required looking after to take out into the field because i will treat it so badly and that <laughs> bag is probably one of the best and it's they're cheap too i mean how much did you pay for it 50 bucks yeah, for an import bag, that's not a bad. You'll get fifty bucks worth of use out of it easily in a couple yeah. of years. I, I mean, mean that was only ten dollars more than than the bag that I spent. That was a rip off from China. That was a piece of crap. So I mean, I'm, yeah. I'm sure it's going to be great. They're worth fifty quid easily yeah. if you can find one. Uh, well, it'd be about forty quid. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, in the UK, you can sometimes get them for twenty pounds, which would be about twenty eight bucks. Uh-huh. But given that it's been imported over there, it's a rare item. Yeah, you know, how did they describe it? Did they call it another arms bergen? Uh huh. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I was kind of <laughs> hoping they called it a clam sh- an SAS clamshell rock. That would have been so <laughs> with a yeah. picture of Sean Kennedy doing thumbs oh, when, up next to it. <laughs> when we first, when when the whole Rangers thing very first started, and we went camping, one of the guys <clears> that went along, a friend of Graffin's, a guy called Sean, ironically enough had watched patrolling and you it was it was like when 
when he watched patrolling, it must have gone all slowed down and soft focus. Like he totally <laughs> fell in love with the idea of being the ultimate wog. Like, yeah. you could, like if he'd been an anime character, little stars or hearts would have formed in his eyes <laughs> as he watched Sean put up that, that shelter out of the two shelter halves. And everybody yeah. else that had ever been camping went, oh, that looks <laughs> bad. I don't want to be that close to the ground. I don't want to be that hemmed in. And he bought all the stuff, like an exact copy of all the stuff. Bought the bag, bought the shelter halves, bought, you know, bought MREs, yeah. the whole works. Had a little radio, all the shit. Like he'd literally, he'd use that as a basis for his shopping list. And he came mm -hmm. out camping with us and had the most miserable time. <laughs> and it was just like, oh, I'm glad somebody else did that. At least I'm now not wandering around going, what if, what if Sean Kennedy's right? What if yeah. that's exactly the way you should do it? And it was like, no, it didn't look like a good idea. Well, I think, I think a lot of us had a kind of a honeymoon period with it. And, you know, I mean, like for me, it was, I think it was the Beltline kit video. Like I, I pretty much, uh, copied that <laughs> for the most part. Uh, like the only thing I didn't get at the time was, uh, was a repelling belt i i ended up getting one later and i and i don't really like it it's not good for much yeah kevin but... got one and it was just like uh i've got a, yeah. i've got a really cool belt at the moment it's just literally just webbing and it's reversible yeah. so i think it's like a like a, a pale olive green on one side and black on the other with just a like a shaped buckle mm -hmm. and it's just really good i mean i don't wear a lot on my belt anymore because of sort of terrorism i don't wear my <laughs> i don't wear my my multi-tool on my belt, even though I reckon I could get away with it because I'm, I'm the, I'm the wrong age range to be stopped, but I just yeah. can't be doing with it because I, I work in a train station, which is now a target in the UK. Yeah. You know, it's on sort of hyper alert. You have to attend security briefings and shit like that. Right. I mean, it is in my bag, but what I did, and here's a tip kids. If you want to carry a multi-tool that's got a knife on it, that's locking and might be seen as an aggressive thing or, a, or an offensive weapon, repair stuff at work mm -hmm. generally speaking people who you work with are useless they're non-tool users that's 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 my new derogatory term is you know snowflakes yeah. kind, of, kind of not okay anymore and red-headed stepchild you know that could be offensive to some people <laughs> and useless prick is often seen as inflammatory but when you call someone a non-tool user <laughs> especially if they're male there's a little bit of them inside that you really get to the quick of an adult human being an adult male human being especially if you just refer to them as a non-tool user you know you're more or less making making a comment on their their, their state of evolution you know implying right. that their thumbs aren't opposable you know just like yeah oh, you're just such a non-tool user well, I, I would so, like I would like to I didn't coin this phrase, but I'd like to popularize this phrase if I can. Yeah. Um, it's uh, it's for all the people who who uh, ha, are just fresh out of college and, and tr trying to get into the workforce and, and don't really know what the real world is like yet, and yeah. and want to kind of uh, um, <clears throat> what is it? kind of inflict their uh, values on onto the rest of society i'm going to start calling that vindictive protectiveness instead of political correctness we're going to go Vind with vindictive protectiveness because protect. that's what they're doing yeah we've made you useless <laughs> you whiny shit you've been vindictively protected yeah. <clears throat> they want you to get out there and die <laughs> so yeah 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 that's it's like you know if you saw them flailing around in the woods you might not rescue them immediately <laughs> you'd like stalk them for a couple of days you know wait till they break and they're sort of like yeah. in tears you know beating their fists on the ground trying to light a fire <laughs> with the bear grill survival kit going why <laughs> why won't it work <laughs> and wait till they're really broken until they sort of like you know you know you're going to walk up you know with a burning torch and they're just going to clutch at your trouser legs and weep <laughs> and then you're going to tell them you've been watching them for a couple of days <laughs> and and i i got that idea from um, a bunch of aborigines that f that there were some um, australian Ar uh, air force pilots that crash landed in arnhem land which is like australian rainforest 
where everything, including plants, insect, everything wants to kill you. Yeah. None of it can eat you, but it all wants you to die with various toxins and poisons and infections and shit. Like the landscape will have a go. You know, so everything, you know, the air, you know, it's so humid that you just lose water so fast and none of the water is particularly potable. And these Aborigine guys, they, these Australian guys have been trained in survival and they're really trying their hardest. And they were in, in sort of like the wilds for about four days before the Aborigines found them and then took them back to their village and then on to the nearest Australian Air Force base. But they've been watching them for those whole four days, wondering what they were doing. <laughs> because these people were so Ill- ill-equipped to be in this most hostile environment they were just astonished and there's yeah. like you'd imagine the aboriginal guys only about 50 yards away watching what are they doing i don't know yeah why, why are they doing that none of us would do that our children wouldn't do that the old people of the village would be kicking their ass at this survival thing people people who are senile would be doing a better job of wandering around in this environment than these guys and they're just yeah. watching them just astonished and it's just that astonishment, you know, sort of like the average. Well, we thought you, we thought you knew what we were doing, you were doing, and that we, we, we had something to learn. So we watched you for four days, and when it became obvious you were going to die, we thought, oh, we better go and see them. And they just sort of like wandered the twenty yards up to them after following them around for four days, going, what "The fuck are they up to? I don't know." So, so yeah, that, that native compassion always ends up biting them yeah. in the ass in the long run. They should just yeah. let people die. Let us dumb people die. Yeah. <laughs> and if I if I could have got to the guys that were in the uh, in the big confederation of Indians that decided to go and you know the guy the pilgrim bods you know the yep. first people to land in America I'd have, I'd have just taken them by the elbow and said come with me these people will steal everything <laughs> they're right? not just going to steal you know they're going to steal your land and imagine having to explain to a Native American or a First Nations person that what do you mean steal where are they going to take it no no yeah. they'll, they'll move you off <laughs> right why would they do that that's not it. They're also going to just pollute it. and uh, None of the water will be drink. Why? Why would they do? And they're going to kill all the buffalo and anything that you could have sustained yourself on. They will wipe that shit out. That it, needs to be a Doctor Who episode. Let, let me explain to you what an endangered <laughs> species is. You know, that's when yeah. you kill something. Well, are they that hungry? No, with the buffalo, they're not even going to eat the meat. They're going to yeah. take the buffalo fur. They're going to like the horns. They're going to make shit out and then they'll leave the meat to rot. <laughs> and the Native American, that's the best bit, I know, but that <laughs> seriously, you have no idea. Yeah. Imagine sort of like with Wahunsa Nakawa and Pocahontas, you know, he's going, Why why do you want to hang out with him? Well, you know, <laughs> he's exotic. <laughs> he's like, Don't fucking do that. You'll you'll die of all kinds of mad shit. I think Pocahontas actually died of syphilis. Hey, really? Thanks, white people. Yeah, nice. Yeah. Cheers. Yeah, I would have stopped them and gone, no, fuck these people. Yep. And it's just like, I look around at people and it's sort of like, oh, you just think, if there is a, an ever dis- And a, a new thing that's pissing me off is people that stand in groups in bottlenecks in open spaces. <laughs> people that stand, like, clustered in doorways or at mm. the top of stairs. And mm-hmm. it's like, you people are fucking dead if there's ever a riot. Yeah. You will be, you, you, you I mean, future trampling victim. <laughs> Or a if, fire, or yeah, a shooting, anything. or or a yeah. truck, whatever. You are dead as dog shit. The second any though any bunch of people want to move quickly through this area, you are standing in entirely the wrong place. You're gonna die, just because yeah. of where you decide to stop and have a conversation. Yeah, this is why I can't be in charge. I'm not allowed to be in charge. I'd fit people with those electro shock dog collars. Like, no, you, <laughs> you're stupid you need to wear one of these so i can repeatedly remind you how stupid you are in fact that's what that's one thing that should be on the internet of things whenever you phone up tech support <laughs> you've got to buckle this on and a little wi-fi signal goes okay so you're wearing the collar right okay great okay it's key to your dna so you know we know you're stupid you're going to say stupid stuff and hopefully we'll train you out of saying the stupid stuff <laughs> Have you tried switching it off and on again? You always say that. Have you done it? No. <laughs> Zap. <laughs> Why do you think we always say that? Because it fixes things nine times out of ten. Yep. So do that before you pick up the phone. And if you pick up the phone and you haven't done that, we both know what's going to happen. And then I want you to switch on your webcam. And if you've got a surprised and hurt look on your face, I'm going to shock you again. 
<laughs> that's that's my super punishment for children. If you look at me like I'm surprised after we've discussed this, I'm going to be so angry. <laughs> I will go berserk. And it really does affect children. It's sort of like it's like you can see in their their eyes. It's like this is something I better remember. I better like right. really remember this thing because he's properly told me like if I look shocked and surprised after he's talked about me looking shocked and surprised, he's going to go fucking mental. And I will kind of, des you can see it in their eyes. They're like, and I will kind of deserve it. You're like the smarter children go, yeah, I'm <laughs> going to really hold on to that thing. I'm going to properly try and remember that bit because th that's, that's the thing that will make me angry. If I've looked at you, you know, look at me in the eyes. I will be angry if you look surprised after we've discussed all this whole thing and you do that thing. And then you come to me and said, I did the thing that you said that you'd be angry about. <laughs> and then I look surprised when you're angry. You, I get double anger. Okay. I'll remember that. And that's, <laughs> you just speak to ch children like they're proper people and go, that will really annoy me. And I will yes. make sure you're bored for hours. Yeah. Boredom is worse than, you know, you Oh can't, yeah. it's just making children bored. I will make you <laughs> bored. <laughs> Have you any idea how patient I can be? That's the terrifying thing about me. I am patient beyond your imagining. I could sit you down on that chair and then read a book silently to myself for the next four hours and have you go mad with boredom. You know, the, the, the worst thing that my parents ever did, um, and they probably did not do this intentionally, so I'm not blaming them or anything. I'm not going to break down and have a fucking Stefan Molyneux talk about how my, <laughs> my childhood was terrible. But, you know, the the one thing that they did was they, they did not understand – a uh, a preteen and teenager um, metabolism that I had, so I had to wait for them to stop to eat all the time. Yeah, and I get fucking angry <laughs> when I yeah. haven't had enough to eat. That so. that still affects me today. It's just sort of like I'm hungry, and I you know live largely on my own, so it's kind of a case of like. I eat when I want. I eat when I'm hungry. I go, right, I'm hungry. I'm going to go and make some food. And when you're in an environment where you're waiting on other people to get hungry. Yep. And this is why whenever I go anywhere with other people, I've got like energy bars and shit like that. Just like, no, I don't trust you to like get hungry when I get hungry. I yeah. And, and if, if that's something that's going to make me angry and I still put myself in that situation when I could have put not put myself in that situation, then I will be angry at me. Mm -hmm. And I'm way better than this. You know, so there's always something. There's always something to eat somewhere in my bag or on my person. It's just like, no. Yeah, people always make fun of me for like carrying around cliff bars and stuff like yeah. that. I'm like, come on, come on. No, eating when <laughs> other people it's practical. eat. practical. Especially for a long period of time. For a day, you can sort of like, yeah, okay, we're going out to dinner. We'll eat when they eat. I can live with it for a bit. Yeah. But, you know, you better not put a, like, a basket of bread rolls in front of me when I'm famished because <laughs> I will just eat all of them. I will grab the basket and ask what you guys are having. <laughs> it's like, no, you haven't fed me. You know, <laughs> properly let the Wookiee win. It's yep. like, no. Um, but when I was sailing and dinner times weren't or any food wasn't at a specific time, I just got into the habit as soon as we hit, the first time we hit port, I just went and got a box of, a couple of boxes of energy bars and just said, look, I get hungry at different times to you. You are welcome to a, one of these bars if you want one. Mm -hmm. But I, you know, if you see me mowing down and it's not because I'm, you know, because I'm being antisocial, because I'm fucking hungry and I'll get cross and grumpy. <laughs> yep. <laughs> you know. Indeed. Yeah. You, you got. You got to just say, look, I know myself. You know. Mm. This is as much for your safety as, as it is for my comfort. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So right before we did the uh, the show, there was there's breaking news of a of a church being shot up, and um, there's at least twenty people dead. I've heard as high as twenty seven now. Wow. And uh, it's just like this stuff. The stuff keeps happening, and it bothers me too because, uh, just from a historical perspective, looking at when they passed the uh, assault weapons ban, there was like three or four 
shootings, you know, high profile shootings, like all within, you know, one year. And then they, they passed it. You know, I'm honestly surprised that nothing happened when we had, you know, uh, uh, Aurora and Orlando and, and Sandy hook. Like I'm, I'm, I was really surprised that nothing happened then. And it, and it's, it, it pisses me off as a gun owner and, and a prepper because I feel like I have to go out and spend a tremendous amount of money that I have to spend the next year paying off because I don't think I'm going to be able to get any of this crap anymore because it's all going to get banned, you know? So I really don't like it. <sighs> Oh, great. Dressed in black tactical gear. All right. <laughs> That's most of my clothing out the window. Yeah. Right. Oh, mind you, not necessarily. It's always black. It's always mall ninjas. Yeah. Fuck. That, yeah, that plate, that, that, uh, sorry, that, uh, that Molly vest that I, uh, uh, wore the black one back uh, when me and uh, Hatter Madness were doing drills in the woods and stuff like that. I, I don't have that anymore. I have a tan mm. one, just for reference. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it must be personal. If you're going to go and shoot up a church, there's got to be some people inside that you want dead. I mean, it's, it's also like, you know, if you've got a problem, it's got to be with a person or a couple of people. I mean, shit, you don't yeah. have to waste a whole church full of people. Well, this is like, I don't know, this is probably like the third one in the last few years. I mean, because there was the, the, the Dylan Roof, like, uh, wannabe Rhodesian psycho kid, and then somebody... Uh, after he did that, shot up a black church, then a black guy went and shot up a white church, and now we got this one. I mean, if you're going to go and shoot up a church, you've got to have some sort of latent Christianity going on in your head anyway. Yeah. You know, for you to go, oh, let's go to the church. Yeah. I mean, you know, I don't, I, <clears throat> I don't think I'd want to kill random people. I mean, if I ever get to the point where I've got to kill someone, that person has got to piss me off, and I won't <laughs> fucking miss yeah <laughs> do you know what i mean it's just it's like i really feel like you know um michael douglas in falling down where he shoots the gangster <laughs> in the leg and goes learn to shoot asshole yeah it's <laughs> like they, they do a drive-by and miss him with every single fucking bullet that they fire and he just yeah. walks up and picks up the duffel full of guns and shoots the guy in the leg and goes it's simple look i point <laughs> it at the thing i want to shoot and then i ventilate the fucker take shooting lessons asshole yeah Yep. I mean, the only <clears throat> time I've ever seen bad guys in a in a like a drama series actually learn to shoot was The Wire. Mm -hmm. And you know that was um, incredible. You know the sort of like the really psychotic um, Snoopy who, who who starts you know boarding people up in row houses with a nail gun. <clears throat> in a in a kind of like a it, and like and they're all drug related killings. They're all hits. But when she's taking people on in her crew, she takes them out to the woods so they can shoot straight and then takes them with paintball guns into deserted buildings. And she's lecturing the kid. It's like, where did you shoot for? You tried to shoot me in the head. Wrong. Shoot me in the, in the, in the, in the center mass. And then mm -hmm. at worst, you've wounded me and you're going to yeah. slow me down. You've not just yep. clearly missed. You know, it's not the Wild West. Shoot, shoot to wound, stroke, kill. And then walk up and kill them. And it's right. just like, well, yeah, you know, just, if, you've, if you're going to shoot someone, either A, be paid a lot of money and have a good idea that that person is an bad person from your perspective, or B, shoot someone specific. I mean, it has to be said, that Las Vegas thing, he had a clear shot at the guy singing on stage. And after yeah. all this sort of like, you know, it was a country and western singer, so, you know. Here's something to write your next fucking song about, right? Okay. <laughs> and could have, or it could at least have like shot the mic out of his hand, or done something interesting. He was only like four hundred yards away. Yeah. With a huge fucking allegedly, you know, we don't know really what went down there. It was all a bit fucked up, all the reporting of it. But anyway, I'm going to assume <clears throat> that that's what happened. And um, 
you know, at least aim. I just like well, light up. That's a- that's one of the things as a gun guy, like that's one of the things that it is so weird about it because yeah, none of these people can fucking shoot. <clears throat> no, well, I mean, for that range I mean, yes, an AR-15 will work, but it's kind of stretching its limits. It's, I mean, you can make a shot that far, well, there but are it is, plenty of it is kind of stretching the limits. The yeah, arc. he could have chosen a higher caliber rifle that would have made yeah. that range easy. He could have he could have used more magnified optics. He used, I, mean, I, I guess, he had rifle. one or two. Yes, a- any deer yeah. rifle would have been good over four hundred yards. Yes, I know. Though you know, let's not. Step away from this is a this is a fucking tragedy. Some entitled prick decided to shoot a whole bunch of people at a concert, and it's not okay. It's not okay under any circumstances. To you've no idea. Even if you were shooting a, a, like a, a like a white power rally, and you're you're, yeah. you're in the hotel and you think, right, I'm going to light people up. This is the difference between the left left wing and and sort of either libertarian or or and right, uh, either libertarian and right right wing people. Right wing people will just light up anybody in the crowd, no matter mm. who they are. You know, mm. a terrorist will just blow away anybody there because if they're there, they're immediately the bad guy. Someone mm-hmm. of a more libertarian bent or a left wing person would look down and see a crowd of people and go, I just don't know what what's going through their heads. What are they thinking? They might be people there going, this guy's a complete fucking lunatic. You know, I've no idea. I've got no way of knowing what those people are like. I've, I've no idea if they've got their kids on their shoulders or if their kids are in front of them, whether the bullet's going to pass straight through. A left-wing person or a libertarian person at, decided to shoot up a Nazi rally would wait until someone really unbearable came on stage. <laughs> Centre in, get comfy, make sure they've had a sandwich, they're good and comfy, their breathing's regular, maybe have a smoke while they're listening to the guy ball out all the rhetoric and just wait for that point where they're just like, no, you've got to be deleted from history and just line up the shot and shoot that person cleanly through the fucking head. I think it's, and it's that just makes a statement. Yes. Executed I think on it's stage, just and you quite right. pack your shit up and fuck off. What we both have, what we both have <laughs> is, is a sense of, of, uh, understanding the ramifications of our actions understanding what legacy we're going to leave yeah you know and and that you know these people these people are obviously unhinged deranged you know <clears throat> and, and I, also the advantage of shooting someone that's massively racist <clears throat> is when you hit jail with the largely black and hispanic population <laughs> and they say what are you in for this is like yeah i shot a neo-nazi through the head at 500 yards and it'll be, did you get him cleanly? Yes, I picked out the round and calibre very, very carefully. I made sure <laughs> nobody was just milling around behind him. I lined up, I breathed properly. I, I meditated on the fact that this person was an evil sack of shit and I was happy to delete him. And I wasn't going to take my own life afterwards. Yeah. Because I believed in my actions. Anybody that shoots himself after they've done that knows they've done a bad fucking thing. Mm-hmm. Or you know, a coward. Yeah, it's just like, yeah. you know, I want my chance to, t- I, I want to be alive so I can sort of like, when they say, why did you do it? You know, what were your motivations? The guy was an evil sack of shit inciting racial hatred or was going to make life pretty much fucking unbearable for a whole bunch of people if they ever saw power. And I saw it as my sacred duty to show people in that situation that there was always going to be a cost. Mm-hmm. And yeah, maybe I'm going to get beaten up in prison by some big, muscly white guys, but I'm fairly sure that because of your prison industrial complex, there are a lot more Hispanic and, and black guys going to be in the prison with me that are going to be like, yeah, you're all right, dude. Mm-hmm. I shot, you know, what did you do? I shot some Nazi scumbag for telling us all black people got to die. It pissed me off. <laughs> oh, okay then. <clears throat> <laughs> yeah. You're eating yeah. with us. You get to keep your dessert. Maybe you're a little safer in the showers. Yeah. You know? And I mean, and that's just, that's why, um, you know, I've just been, <clears throat> I've just been trying to kind of raise awareness, raise consciousness of the Rangers uh, to, you know, who they're supporting, what these groups are, you know, like they, everybody's free to do whatever they want, obviously. And oh, everybody's, absolutely. you know, I mean, able I've, to express their opinion on this show. I mean, I've come to the conclusion that <clears throat> basically there is, there is a, like a, a, like an overall hierarchy. 
mm-hmm. if you don't see yourself in that hierarchy, then you're being you're generally being used. Mm-hmm. And like all these things where there is a hierarchy, like you know, white power groups and stuff like that, I've got a hierarchy. You know, mm-hmm. you're in it for so long as a grunt and you turn up to demonstrations and you wave a Confederate flag or a swastika or whatever the fuck it is, wind up a load of people. And then maybe you'll be in charge of organizing one of these events. Maybe you'll be a spokesperson. And then, you know, like along the David Duke lines, you'll achieve because you represent so many people, you'll achieve a kind of sick kind of respectability. And then you get to like government. And the reason you're doing all this is not necessarily because you believe in white power. It's because you want to be at that trough where all that money is. Mm-hmm. You want, you want, you know, misguided donations by parts of the military industrial complex to come your way so that if you do get duly elected as a representative of the people, you're going to be making laws that benefit them. Mm-hmm. And I think an awful lot of it is much more cynical than we dare believe. Yeah. And I think the same is true of religion. Yeah, you know, I think the same is true of people that okay, I'm gonna, to the Republican Party. I'm going to tie this together here. Mm. So, um, <clears throat> one of the things, one of the thing, you know, me and uh, me and Kevin uh, were having, uh, you know, debates on on what because we were talking about the recent Antifa antics mm. and so forth and the whole and i just i just whole... want to clarify this i'm not saying yes. i would ever be the lone gunman shooting a white i i still believe that person can be reconciled to being a decent human being yeah i don't think i'll ever find myself on top of a tall building shoot i think it's funny when you talk about it it outrages me that so many bystanders get killed whenever anybody does something like this and that's that's my point you know if you really hate someone learn to shoot yeah, <laughs> you know, if you've really got no other choice than to blow someone away because you can't have a chat with them or you can't say, look, this, this, <laughs> you're fucking crazy. Um, learn to shoot. Don't hit yeah. innocent people. I mean, you know, what about, you know, what if it, you know, say you, you shoot the guy and then the bullet travels through them and kills the sound engineer on the stage. Mm-hmm. Maybe that guy didn't have a lot of choices. It's, it's a bit like the clerks, clerks thing where they talk about blowing up the Death Star. What about all the plumbers and janitors? on board right. the Death Star when it got blown up, you know, did you not think of them? When they yep. could have just gone, you know what, let's just see if we can assassinate the Emperor instead and maybe have a reasonable chat with all the other stormtroopers and shit. Because mm-hmm. the stormtroopers are clones, they didn't get any choice. Mm-hmm. You know, it's just like, what the fuck? You know, so like, so you're killing all these people to get to this one person. That's what they do. Yes. You could do something much more constructive. Anyway, just so please carry on. I just want to clear that <laughs> okay. up. I don't no, advocate yeah. shooting or killing people. I advocate actually trying to have a conversation, trying to find out the root of their pain that makes them hate other people so much. Yes. To say, look, and talk. and that's that's what we were talking about. Is is I don't I don't want anybody to because they feel like they they identify with certain groups or whatever to to be cavalier about violence. I don't want I don't want people to 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 think it's trivial because it's not um you know uh the time and place and circumstance and all of that is is very specific um <clears throat> but um you know we were we were talking about this and and we were talking about I mean uh I personally think that you know Antifa is kind of strayed from you know uh when when i first saw them in like the mid mid 90s um talking about punching nazis and i saw them their photos of you know being protesting you know obviously uh neo nazi rallies and i was like okay this is you know maybe i can get on board with this <clears throat> um but uh you know obviously i didn't um and and uh, looking at what they've become now, about you know basically just uh, w- wanting to to punch uh, mainstream Republicans, I think they've they've kind of drifted from there, from their original you know mandate. Um, the the thing is is that uh, who who really is who, who when you're saying punch a Nazi, who's a Nazi? I mean who. Obviously, I mean, uh, Nazis are gone. Okay, whatever whoever exists now, you know, the worst of the worst, the people that might deserve it, are are neo Nazis. Okay, 
And then within that group, you have white supremacists. Okay, so I would kind of put them in the same category as the neo Nazis. And then you have white separatists. And then you have, and then it goes on and on and on down, you know, through the spectrum, <clears throat> you know, to to maybe like a a uh, you know slightly slightly racist white person or whatever. But I mean, like the the spectrum is is crazy. And what I was what I'm getting at is <clears throat> like I listen to I listen to metal, right? And uh, and the one of the same corollaries that I see in metal, I- as far as like who who uh, how do, how do we identify any of this any of this spectrum? Okay, um, in metal, you know people people say that uh, some people in metal are Satanists. Right. Hmm. Some, you know, obviously there's metal artists that use like satanic imagery. Some people, use, some of some people in metal use satanic lyrics. OK. Um, what, you know, what percentage of them, if you were to ask them, oh, Satanists. would they would they say are actually Satanists? You oh, know, and how do you how do you judge? Yeah. How do you judge it? Like. It, it's you know they they're. I mean, you've you've really got to understand where metal comes from in order to get <clears throat> that it isn't about Satanism. I'm metal was born in the '60s, out of people that weren't that into flower power type music and the hippie music that was going around at the time. But they had watched lots of Hammer House of Horror movies. Right. And I'm not joking. It's actually from there. The name Black Sabbath comes from a from a really hokey horror movie. Yeah. You know, when, when Ozzy Osbourne and co was sort of going, oh, right, it should be like this. It was because that they'd read horror comics as kids and snuck into horror movie showings at cinemas and gone, oh, we should do that on stage. Mario and, Bava, 1963. Yeah. So yeah. they'd watch these films. <clears throat> and, you know, in those films, if you listened very carefully to Black Sabbath's first album, The Devil's Chord, which crops up in a couple of the songs, that really discordant awful sound that they were using comes directly from those cheesy horror movies Mm -hmm. so it's a bit like um i don't know uh basing a band on tales from the crypt yeah you know with that sort of like tongue-in-cheek sort of pseudo horror Mm -hmm. you know or you know or having an elvira mistress of the dark tribute band Mm -hmm. and claiming that they're satanists yeah I mean, what's happened is the Black Sabbath go, right, okay, so we've got an upside down cross. Oh, that would be brilliant on the album cover. And there's mist surrounding our feet. Yeah, absolutely fantastic. It's just like a Hammer House horror movie. Won't it be funny? Mm-hmm. And then everybody else has gone, well, they did this and we need to do something a bit more extreme. And it's sort of got more Exactly. Money. I mean, if exactly. you want to get the flavor of Hammer House and horror, horror films, watch a movie called Psychomania, <laughs> which is okay. the stupidest fucking horror. It's have to look that one up. It, it, it's, the mad thing about it is it's a proper sort of heavy metal inspiring film. There's no gore in it really, except for the really stupid kind. <laughs> but the but the theme song, and I stress the theme song, which was available as a single and sold in the cinemas themselves, is a is a hippie flower power song. Mm, mm-hmm. About being in a motorcycle gang. <laughs> it's like the Shirelles leader of the pack is a more worthy song than the song in this movie. <laughs> Go and watch it. It's on YouTube, Psychomania. It's very, very funny. It's a proper British movie. And it even stars people that were in um, Carry On films after that. Mm-hmm. It's a proper like British film industry of the 60s where people are trying to make everything on the cheap. It is risible. But that's where heavy metal originally comes from. It's like a stage thing. But what you've also got to remember is the hippies at the time were doing lots of weird stage performances and bands that you wouldn't believe did happenings like Genesis was mm-hmm. a pro- was originally a prog rock band that did all sorts of weird shit on stage. Like right. the most the most white bread band in the universe. The most boring 70s stadium rock came out of these <laughs> happenings that was very sort of hippie and trippy and people were doing psychedelics. And then but and that's fine if you're middle class and in London. But the the people that were in Black Sabbath, like Tommy Iommi and and uh, Ozzy Osbourne, were working in in like you know in in foundries, 
Mm -hmm. You know, and this hippy dippy shit wasn't working for them because if you went around with long hair and bell bottoms and flowers sewn onto your jeans, you'd have got the shit kicked out of you in Birmingham (laughs) for being a bloody puff. You know, you'd have got proper beaten up. So this was like they wanted a music that they could control the feel and all, you know, almost multimedia. We want the look, the sound, the, you know, the feel yeah. of, a, of, a hammer, of a hammer horror movie. We yeah. want to go the other way. And that's all that is. It's just a response musically to all the all the trippy music and psychedelic imagery that was going about. And this was to frighten the shit out of, you know, middle class hippies. And it bloody worked. <laughs> you know but then it's sort of like as you ramp it up as every, everybody's got to be slightly more extreme to compete with you know when you're starting out you want to be more than Black Sabbath you want to be more you know more dark and disturbing than Deep Purple and shit exactly and these are people you know that's why you've got so many bands that are named after you know characters in Edgar Allan Poe and stuff like that and H.P. Lovecraft and stuff it's because they're going for that sort of almost kitsch horror Yes, movie, but as a, as music. So none of them are Satanists. Right. There aren't there aren't actually any Satanists. In order to be a Satanist, you're not pagan or anything. You've got to be like an inverted Christian. So in order yeah. to be a Satanist, you've got to believe that there's a heaven and a hell. Right. And it's just like when somebody says, "Oh, you know, your music's shocking." It's the, you know, is that is that recapturing that that bit when Elvis appeared on the Ed Sullivan show. And America lost its mind in the 50s. <laughs> I just went, holy shit, you know, teenagers and fucking sexual imagery in songs. But the same thing had happened with blues in the 30s and jazz in the 20s. Because <laughs> yeah. most jazz songs are about heroin from the 20s and cocaine abuse and shit. <laughs> and then you got like, you know, the blues, which is about, you know, horror of horrors being poor and black. And then rock and roll picks up that and then, you know, every generation wants to shock the crap out of people it's it's happened about four times in my lifetime about every 10 years a new style of music comes along whether it's gangster rap or it's you know the manchester music scene or you know people talking about being on ecstasy or lsd and shit like that it's all designed you every teenager wants to buy a record that upsets their parents yeah that's part of your growing up as a teenager so, like, none of those people are Satanists. But <laughs> none of them. Zero. I mean, they'll all talk about... I mean, you, you see Os- Ozzy Osbourne, and the most daring thing they could say on television is like, oh, yeah, you know, we hung a cross upside down in the studio and all sorts of weird stuff started happening. And yeah. people had just seen The Exorcist yeah. and stuff like that were just losing their <clears> fucking <throat> minds, all because they were joking about with their audience. And, oh, yeah, you know, that night we sacrificed a goat to the devil and shit. And uh, I got a blister on my finger from that. You know, I think that was Satan talking to me. It's like, fucking hell. He's, like, he's obviously <laughs> on a total wind-up chair. <laughs> so, like, what's going to really freak out the parents of the people? Because you're not they're not selling it to the parents of the children that are buying it. They're selling it. Oh, aren't they fucking hardcore? They are. Get Let's make a Ouija board. Yeah. Yeah. Let's make I mean, at, at worst, you could say that perhaps... Uh, you know, Ozzy Osbourne and Black Sabbath were like had occult influences, mm. but nothing, nothing, any, anything worse than that. I mean, like not not Black Sabbath, not Alice I'm, Cooper, not what, you know any of the people that. that Interestingly, that, enough, the same thing happened when um, Mary Shelley wrote Frankenstein. Yeah, the same hysteria. Think of the children hysteria hit when they got back to England after she wrote Frankenstein in Switzerland. Yeah. You know, people going, oh, right, you're, you're into the... You're into... Because Shelley used to go to hotels and when they sort of like, you know, sort of profession, he would put atheist. And because in hotels you have to say where you're going on to if you're in a foreign country at the time. And he went, desti- and when you had to put destination, he used to write hell. <laughs> just to wind people up. He was the Ozzy Osbourne of his day. Just doing shit, just to deliberately wind people up. Because he knew if he wound people up, lots of really intense young men at Oxford would buy his fucking poems. Yeah. And and smoke and uh, and smoke cigarettes and talk darkly of the other worlds and stuff like that. And, you know, Frankenstein came out of, of basically teenagers winding each other up in a rented cottage in a foreign country at two in the morning. You know, and, and that's exactly she. She basically she was the Ozzy Osbourne of their of their day. She used to write letters to newspapers about you know all the dark things 
and when Shelley drowned and and stuff like that, and she, they burnt his heart on the shore of the lake that he died on and shit. It's oh, just mental shit. So proper like you know emo kids just winding up the establishment, and that's what all a lot of that is. I've got a horrible feeling that some of this neo-Nazi shit is a little bit like that, but it's all a sliding scale. I mean, there's there's yeah. metal bands that say they're neo-Nazis and stuff like that, but mm-hmm. the thing is, if you got long hair and you wear makeup and you're jumping around on stage wearing a swastika <laughs> you're like the person hitler would have liked the least hitler right. was ultra conservative yeah you've, you've missed yeah. the point of being a nazi completely yeah. you know and when you get someone that's a lot more intelligent like marilyn manson appearing in like a nazi <clears throat> outfit you know he's doing he's actually doing it ironically or he was trying to he probably doesn't do anything like it now poor fucker he's talented as fuck He's the most intelligent person I've ever heard speak on the hysteria of, of parents because mm-hmm. he's been the butt of it. And he's a really, he's a really lovely man. I'd love to meet him. He sounds like a hoot to hang out with. Well, and it's also like a kind of like, can you appreciate somebody's music because their art is separate from the person? Like, like whether this guy in real life is an asshole or like, you know, a bigot or whatever, like, can he make yeah, music I've... that has nothing to do with that, that you can still appreciate? Um, I'll give you an example. It's not a very good one. There's a chap <clears throat> called John Martin, who's like the guitarist guitarist, you know, he's, you know, as far as acoustic and folk goes, you know, sort of like, he's, it's like, um, Oh, there's a good example. John Denver. Mm -hmm. Millions of people think, you know, people have got together. People have been married to his music and all this sort of shit. It's really, you know, it's really brilliant imagery. It's poetry. It's a love of the natural beauty of America, pretty much. You could sum up all his music in a a love of being outdoors in America. Mm -hmm. Okay. And he was an abusive drunk. Yeah. He was not a nice person you know, for a large percentage of his life. I mean, he chilled out towards the end of his life and, and like, figured out that he'd gone right off the deep end. But he was a failed satirical songwriter when mm-hmm. he became John Denver. Um, and he treated several, you know, he had, like, um, he was married a couple of times and had children in both those marriages and was not nice during all of that. Yeah, I can still listen to his music. Mm-hmm. Um, you know... There are examples of people just go, okay, your music transcends your thing. Where now, the, I think the thing is, is where where your art is your message, mm-hmm. and your your message is negative. And yeah, but right that's, then, that's the thing. If someone normally, doing, I would normally see, I would agree with you, but then, uh, but then you still got that question about like what what counts as as part of the message i mean if they use you know symbolism with uh you know uh baphomet or inverted crosses or or pentagrams or something like that oh you say so the imagery that goes along with the music if the music is good does it does it uh, make the imagery acceptable well i mean just to to what extent does it matter I guess is what I'm saying. Yeah, I think. Well, okay. Here's another example. Have you ever seen Pink Floyd's The Wall, the film? Yeah. Where he comes out on stage and he's dressed up as a Nazi. Yeah. Now, if you just took a snapshot of that image and said, "Go watch this film," mm-hmm. you'd be like, uh, "Okay." When the guy <laughs> flips out and becomes completely fascist and incites the crowd to beat up people in the crowd that aren't like him. Mm-hmm. I think so. That if you didn't put it in the context of the rest of the work has a very horrifying message, Mm -hmm. but it's a very important message. Now it's literally the whole point of that is like, this is what happens when somebody has no checks and balances in their life anymore. You know, they've, they've sealed themselves off from humanity so much they can safely hate it and incite others to hate it. 
So that's well, that's I, got that's I, got no, that's got very negative imagery, but it's an important piece, and I would listen to it, and I like the song. Yeah. Well, like okay, so uh, let me let me remove it from from the Nazi thing or the satanic thing because that's a little bit you know uh, too much of a hot button thing. Let's let's find something that we both agree on. So, like if we look at if we look at like hardcore punk, for instance, mm. okay. Uh, crust punk, uh, D beat punk specifically, like stuff like that. Okay, they use like horrible imagery of war and stuff like that on their on their album covers. You know, people dying, the Khmer Rouge, like shooting people in the head, and well, all holiday, this kind of stuff. Holiday in Cambodia. Yeah, they're they're using that imagery to point out that it's bad, and their songs yeah. are about how this shit is bad. Yeah. But if, but if you just looked at the imagery, you'd say, oh, well, they're promoting it. If they're, you're just looking at the CD. Yeah, I suppose, yeah, if you looked at a Dead Kennedys album or a Clash album, <clears throat> you know, lots of the punk labels have got things like Louder Than War. Uh, yeah. And sort of like really sort of like, you know, violent imagery. But it's, you know, it's an, and that is an interesting point. It's kind of like a musical violence against those who commit violence. Yeah. Yeah. And I completely agree with the punk ethic. I think, you know, I grew up in the 70s. You know, I was slightly too young to go to punk concerts. But I had cousins that went to punk concerts and wore dog collars and, and DMs. And I think I thought it was pretty fucking cool. Mm -hmm. Because it was so grim and dark. And, th yeah. you know, Britain had a, a, a like a, an official unemployment figure of over three million. Mm -hmm. You know, like ch kids were coming out of schools with good qualifications and then sitting on the dole for years, living in squats. And punk is born out of that. Punk is, you know, if you're going to, you know, if I've, if you're going to tell me I'm nothing, I'm going to be the most terrifying nothing you've ever seen. Right. You know, I'm going to scare the shit out of you and because you think I'm nothing. You think I'm disposable. So I will wear disposable things. Mm hmm. You know. How dare you make me aspire to this shit? You know, it's basically the aspirations of the time were so meaningless and crap. I think if I'd been a teenager at that time, I would have gone straight off the deep end into it. I'd have thrown myself into that movement. Even yeah. though it seemed to be sort of like people wandering around and drawing swastikas. I mean, the reason you see some punk people with swastikas drawn on them is because that's mm -hmm. the most shocking thing they can adorn themselves with. Yeah. They're not saying, let's, you know, let's now hunt down black people and Jews. Mm -hmm. They're saying this, you need to be terrified of me. Yeah. You know, I need to frighten you so badly that you properly think about what, you know, why I'm so disenfranchised. Yep. And that, I think that message kind of got lost with subsequent sort of punk movements. And I think the neo-Nazis then kind of hijacked the skinhead. I mean, the skinhead haircut is basically, I can't afford to go to the hairdressers. Well, it's, it's you know, Jamaican I, originally. Yeah. And I, and, I, and my my best friend, he he got into the 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 non-racist skinheads. I mean, he, he was never any part of any group. Like, he wasn't part of Sharp or anything like that. Mm -hmm. But, like, I mean, he he went into it, you know, for quite a while. Um when we were when we were teenagers and i was i i didn't uh i didn't become a part of it just because like i knew how stigmatizing and, and misunderstood he was going to be mm. doing that yeah. um i mean and he and the skinheads uh you know even the non-racist variety are are extremely it's extremely violent culture it tends mm. to be <laughs> so <laughs> like no matter what, you're probably going to get beat up a few times. Well, it's it's a response to the numbing effect of consumerism. But I mean, in particularly in Britain in the seventies, there you know everybody was poor. You know, I didn't meet any middle class people for a long, long, long time. You know, the yeah. Poor, not only were there a lot of poor people, but there were also think you know there were there were electricity strikes, there were gas cuts. You know, they would t you know it was a bit like being in a in a uh, a, a communist country mm -hmm. in the you know at nine o'clock at night they cut off all the heating mm -hmm. you know uh, so, shit hit the fan every day they well they didn't collect <laughs> garbage for like four months yeah. because of a strike and you imagine four yeah. months of garbage piling up outside That's a block terrible. of flats 
Yeah. Imagine a, 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 a like a, I mean, basically housing projects where no yeah. garbage is being collected, children being bitten by rats yeah. in their in their in their cribs. Yeah. And so you know, it happened like five doors up from me. You know, no gar people not being buried, the army having to be grave diggers mm -hmm. and collect garbage and be the fire service because of all the strikes. So it's mm -hmm. a pretty frightening time to find yourself in. And then to yeah. have grown up in that and seen all that depression and the very drab place that England was in in the 70s. And then somebody comes along and goes, if they're going to treat us like crap, we should scare the shit out of them. You know, yeah. because because the only music that you could listen to was stuff like Rod Stewart or Elton John, you know, people that were millionaires singing about heartbreak. And when you're talking <laughs> about some realities like not having enough money to eat, yeah, that tends to make people freak out a bit. And well, was re almost... reality was ugly, and they were trying to put a mirror up to that, reflect yeah, that back they were, to they everyone. They were trying to make sure that the people that you know didn't have to look at the ugliness had to look at it, even mm -hmm. if it was only in the newspapers or on the television. Mm -hmm. You know, because people couldn't understand. There are some wonderful documentaries about even very accepting parents going. Well, I don't know why they do it, you know, with the safety pin through the nose. <laughs> well, I suppose I better, you know, give them a, you know, you got sort of like really concerned parents giving their kids lifts to punk concerts. Yeah. I mean, there was one amazing one where this girl who's, who lives in Manchester is having all her clothes made by her mum, like all these punk clothes and putting artful stitching and, and slits hmm. and, and safety pinning up the back and all that sort of thing and really doing some major dress design. So that this girl, her daughter's got like a unique dress to wear when she goes out for the evening. Yeah. And she became so famous for sort of like being on television and stuff. She's actually on the album cover of one of the punk collections that I've got. <laughs> you know, it's just like she is the face of punk. You know, this sort of like, you know, so parents weren't horrified. I mean, it's also because people weren't as politically aware. Yeah. You know, people couldn't, you know, express that in, in like a, a coherent sentence. You know, so, but this feeling of sort of like destroying everything, including yourself. Yeah. You know, if you're going to try and destroy, destroy me, I'm going to get there first. I watched an amazing documentary, uh, not a documentary, an actual film with Tim Roth in it. It was Tim Roth's mm -hmm. breakout performance called Made in England. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And it's an amazing, amazing film. And if you haven't watched it, it's on YouTube. Go find it. Um, got put onto it by a guy called, um, what's his name? I've subscribed to him. He's he's very interesting YouTuber. Talks about left wing and Marxist philosophy and stuff. He's a proper lefty, but he's like you know, basically the modern equivalent of punk. Mm -hmm. Dick Coughlin. I don't know if you've seen. Well worth a watch. Mm. I got into him via Contrapoints. Mm -hmm. And Contrapoints is kind of like an extremely dolled up. I mean, it's it's not sort of like labeling to call her a transgender woman but she does these amazing very very um theatrical videos about you know um philosophy and you know intellectually taking things apart you know sort of like and things on social justice warriors and stuff like that and she's like a fan of his and he just yeah. sits in his bedroom in London just going, these are all these fucking cunts telling me that I got, you know, just really, like, you can see the spittle fly out of him and he's got like, you know, 12,000 subscribers and he's been going for like 10 years and he's just like, it's like angry as anything. <laughs> and uh, some of the comments on his, I, I, I almost got involved in a flame war before I walked away. I sort of like, you know, somebody left a thing. It's like, well, I've never seen any racist people in London. <laughs> or anywhere where I've been. It's like, where the fuck have you been, man? <laughs> it's not like, it's, they're all around. But yeah, so I got involved in that and I shouldn't have done. But yeah, so there, there's a, there, but as you say, there's a spectrum of it. Yeah. And some people, I mean, you could say Robert Heinlein is a fascist. Depending on which book you read. Yeah. Yeah. But he also, you know, and he, you know, he's he's either libertarian or, you know, obviously he was writing in the fifties when Ayn Rand was doing her utmost to be as weird as possible. Yeah. So obviously people were picking up those ideas of the self and how important you are as an individual and what does communism mean? I mean, imagine being a science fiction writer in the fifties and not writing about communism. Yeah. I mean, well, she came from that. Yeah. You know, and that's and that's another thing. Like a lot of people forget is that. 
you know, like a lot of these, a lot of the libertarians, like the, the early libertarians, the ones that started everything. I mean, a lot of them were Jews coming out of Germany yeah. and, or, or in uh, Ayn Rand's case out of Russia. Yeah. The idea um, of the state controlling everything you fucking do is, is kind of alarming. So you yeah. fight back against that. You go, no, yeah, no, I'm, exactly. I'll, I'll do what I want to do. I mean, part of the whole patrolling thing, where am I going? Who's coming with me? Yeah. You know, and that's that's actually a, a more inclusive version of Randite thinking. Mm -hmm. You know, yes. so I am an individual yes. first. I will mm. be part of your team. But if I plan, I definitely plan to go and do something. You not coming with me will not stop me. And that's a very positive message. That means, look, you're an individual, creative and capable on your own. And I want everybody to to emphasize um, the self empowerment. And the statement that he made, you know, several times, no more victims. Yeah. You know, I mean, like, like we, it seems we can all too often forget um, that attitude, but um, it comes oh, from a very powerful place. Yeah. Just, you know, just go, right, no. I mean, just even if you just say to yourself, I reject this, in what way can I reject this status quo or this attitude that is being foist upon me? You know, how do I reject it so that I'm happy with it, with my rejection yeah. of it? You know, so if that's growing your hair long or it's not shaving or it's, you know, it's, you know, or it or it's not even if you don't want to get into consumerism, which is almost impossible in the West. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's there are there's so much crap you need, especially if you're going to do something creative. But if you want to be like, you know, technologically creative, like we're being now, I mean, shit, you know, you're sitting there with, you know, the symbol of um, consumerism on your desk. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the very symbol of unrepairable consumerism. <laughs> and I'm not doing yeah. that. That's that's just the computer you have. No, I you know I, I understand. Like, but what I try and do is buy all my shit secondhand. I, a little bit of me dies when I have to buy a new piece of technology and go. Mm -hmm. I'd have much rather gone down to a pawn shop or its equivalent or a trading center or something like that, or found it, you know, in a in a goodwill. But occasionally you can't because what because the technology that is the cheapest way of doing something that you shouldn't be able to do. I mean, it's like what we're doing is we're taking back radio from the infrastructure that would stop us doing it with this. Yeah. This will go out and albeit on YouTube or archive.org. But we're using kit that we can afford to do it. You know, yeah, I've had to buy some new connector boxes. You know, it's literally stuff to convert signals into a different format so I can use it. But the camera I'm shooting it on is second hand. You know, the microphones are second hand, you know, the lighting, yeah, it was new. But, you know, the sort of like, you know, it was cheap. It's all it's all kind of accessible. But whenever I buy anything like a piece of hardware, like a laptop, I always do try and see if I can get it second hand first. Mm -hmm. Because otherwise it would either, you know, in someone else's house, it would sit in a drawer unused because they wouldn't have traded it in for something if they didn't, if they weren't, if they were going to use it. You know, or it's secondhand because somebody's bought one and gone, all oh, right. I mean, I want to start doing a few like little manuals on how to do stuff on paper. And a friend of mine's got a slightly dodgy duplex laser printer. He just said, you know, if you can come over and grab it, you can have it, you know, because I don't use it. And it's like, it's that or landfill. I'd rather, I'd rather remove stuff from the landfill cycle than buy it new. But occasionally you don't have a choice. Some stuff is too new for it to have become secondhand. Yeah. You know, I, I want to build a TV studio. Because if I can build it on my wages, then that's ridiculous. I've got to be, you know, I'm, yeah. about, I'm about $200 a month off what you would get if you were on welfare. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, if I can make it, then, you know, if I can build a TV studio, then any idiot can. And if I can do it with my level of knowledge of technology as well, anybody can do it. So. Well, that's another thing with like prepping and stuff like that. I mean, everybody thinks it's like an insurmountable, surmountable obstacle. It's like it's it's this whole oh my gosh, like how could I possibly 
you know, start doing this. Like it's, it's just so, it's so big, but I mean, like I started on $20 a day or not yeah. a day, <laughs> $20 a month. Sorry. Well, that's why I did um, that thing on episode one of Rangers TV, where I just got all the spare change out of my house that are just acquired. You know, these were like, you know, one penny, two penny and five penny pieces. Just put them in a jar and then went out and bought two weeks worth of food. Yeah. I just like, well, it wasn't the best food in the world, but it insulated me for, 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 for three or four days from everything going wrong. And that's where you start. Just buy slightly more than you would normally of long term mm -hmm. food storage. Just buy an extra can of beans. Yeah. 20 cents. Start with one can of beans and put it in a different cupboard. A bag of pasta or a bag of rice. Just keep stashing it away. Because it will, it, it's, and it's not just sort of like for when the zombies come. It's for, you know, if you lose your job or you don't get paid sick pay or, you know, you have to have a couple of days off. You're just mm -hmm. insulating yourself from external harm just by a limit, a tiny, tiny amount. Well, and like from about, what was it, like around 2007 or eight to 2010, like it's just seemed like food was getting more and more expensive all the time and it was never going to go down. Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, eventually it did go down, but it took several years. Mm -hmm. So, I mean... Put it away while it's cheap. Yeah. Don't buy anything you're not good. You don't enjoy eating. <laughs> yeah. Don't buy yeah. food that you're like, ah. Oh. <laughs> you know. That's that's why I haven't you know gone out and you know bought a one of those pre-packaged you know year supply of food or whatever you know that oh, I'm, I'm not awful. yeah not that I could afford a year supply but I mean like it's. A, two months, three months or something like that. You know, I, yeah. I don't buy like that. You know, if I buy anything in bulk, it's going to be something like rice, beans. or Yeah. Those things should come with like one single sealed round of ammunition in them. <laughs> so you've always got a last bullet. So you've got a choice <laughs> whether you eat the emergency protein bar that tastes faintly of lemon. Just like, you know, just like as you undo the packet, just a, like a single round of nine mil just drops out. And it's like, or it's yeah. survivalist, so it'd be a single long long rifle two two round. Yeah. <laughs> yep. And a coin. <laughs> <laughs> the most depressing survival kit in the world. <laughs> Flip a coin. <laughs> uh, and it lands on the side with the picture of the survival wafer on it, and you're going, okay, best out of three. <laughs> 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 Oh man, there's a scene in Red Dwarf where there's trapped on a snow planet. Uh, I don't know if you've ever seen Red Dwarf. A little bit. It's, it's British science fiction, and they crash the little shuttle craft on a snow planet in true Star Trek fashion. And of course, one of them's a hologram, and one of them's Dave Lister, and the hologram's sort of like trying to g him up and talk him through stuff. And they go looking through all the cupboards on this shuttle, and they come up with a can of dog food and a pot noodle. And he goes, "Well, well, the choice is clear." <laughs> there's no way I'm eating a pot noodle and you see him eating the dog food first you know, just... <laughs> no yeah actually uh, when I was in high school the teacher that taught me uh, how to do web design he was a Red Dwarf fan so he would play it while we were coding <laughs> there's, a, there's a wonderful bit in Zed Nation actually on one of the, on the latest season where they're trapped in this underground bunker of some kind <coughs> and they're all they're all in this cage <coughs> and they look up and there's a chute mm -hmm. and um they're sort of like what's the chute for and there's a there's a little pause and all these sort of like dog kibble comes rolling down the chute and you think their reaction is going to be oh you bastard you're feeding us dog food while we're chained up <laughs> and two of the characters go fantastic oh this stuff is great i love dog kibble because they because the world's been ended for like five years remember that time in boston where we found that huge big sack of dog kibble oh good times man <laughs> so, uh, dog biscuits are pretty fucking good i mean that, that that's a terrible thing dog biscuits you know like bonios and stuff like that have probably got more nutritional value than the emergency biscuits they send out with the with unicef yeah they're probably better for you 
And also, here's here's a tip: if you're in a crowded supermarket and you want a bit of like elbow room so you can wander around unimpeded, open up a, bo- a box of bonio and start eating them as you're going. Around. <laughs> People get the fuck out of your way if you're eating those bone-shaped dog biscuits as you're walking around with a bit of a meaningful look on your face. Yeah. You know the way some parents open up a open up a pack of a pack a pack of potato chips to yeah. stop their kids from screaming and then pass the empty wrapper <laughs> through. Yeah, do that with a box of Bonios. Oh, it's <laughs> mental. It's really funny. People will get out of your way. It's hysterical. Because they just yeah. taste like meaty digestive biscuits. There's nothing wrong with them. Yeah. You know, that's the thing. Western civilization, our dog food passes human consumption laws. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's perfectly okay to eat dog food. It tastes like shit. But but dog biscuits are actually quite nice. Not the little diamond ones because you and certainly not the little black ones because they mostly got carbon in them because they're to aid the dog's digestion. <laughs> so you know, but just the little brown ones, the treaty dog biscuits, and not the ones with the marrow in them. They're a bit grim. But just the biscuit biscuit ones that you know. You heard it here first, guys. Yeah, don't. I mean, and, it, and also in a survival situation, people are going to like be leaving that shit behind. Oh yeah, I know. Yeah, it's good stuff. Yeah. I know that sounds really ridiculous, <laughs> but there are worse things you can eat. Oh man! Uh, In fact, if you are, if if you if you gave me the choice of a couple of bonios or a Twinkie, I'd probably go for the bonios. Do you, you, you know, well, you even though the Twinkies a... have got a longer shelf life. <laughs> you know, you got to do a Rangers TV episode on that. It'll go viral. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Just a box of bonios. <laughs> oh, fucking mint. Have the added advantage. Uh, you shouldn't even food. mention it. Just so, like, you know, here's my here's my uh, weekly haul of uh, survival food, and you, know, you just got a <laughs> box of bonios there. I first ate them on a dare. Somebody went, "Oh, you'll never eat one of them." And I went, oh, look all right. <clears throat> They're nice. <clears throat> Yep. There, was a, there was a punk. There was a punk song called "Dog Food." <laughs> Dog food is so good for you. Makes you strong and clever too. Dog <laughs> food is the current craze. Eat some every day. Ra ra. It's like yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's why I have a cat so I can eat my tuna. Yeah, that's what around. I've got. That's part of my practice: <laughs> tuna for the cat. Yeah. Although I have a feeling that as soon as the um, the supply of Dreamies drops out, she'll just fuck off. <laughs> she'll be gone. Uh, I'm out of here. Cats are addicted to those things. Yeah, I'm trying to wean her off them at the moment. It's, it's getting um, it's getting pretty unpleasant because she'll come and attack me if she hasn't had any. <laughs> it's like pretty harsh. The cat will just go, ah. It's <laughs> like, just like shit. <laughs> I'll get you a cat crack. There you go. We cat owners have a have a different um, perspective on human nature because we understand um, what hungry, pissed off animals will do. Yeah. Oh, they get pretty stroppy. <laughs> and it's not like a dog. A dog will just whine and look at you sad and put its head on its paws and just sort of sidle up to you and try and remind you, nudge you with its nose. A cat will actually come and scratch you. It's like, where's my food at, shithead? Yep, and it's just like wow. It's like it's a completely different relationship. I will end you, bastard. <laughs> yeah, this is all. And cats have got this. This is all your fault. Look. Yeah, it's, it's all gone wrong, and it's your fault. <laughs> I shouldn't have to tell you. It should just fucking happen. Yep. But yeah, cats are cool. But uh, yeah. Sorry for the weird noises in the background. I am like trying to squeeze out every single little bit of e juice I still have left to run my mod here. All right. <clears throat> oh, I found out a cool thing today. Although everybody knows it, I started having a go at programming those little Baofeng radios. Yeah. Which everybody should own, by the way. Yep. And everybody should immediately upgrade the aerial. Yes. Because the aerial is garbage. Um, I've just that. ordered ordered a couple so mine are all on the, the, the i had a chat with graffin and apparently the best aerials for these are the nagoya whip aerials that are about 30 centimeters long mm-hmm. they're a bit cumbersome 
but they are good. I mean, the ultimate best, if you've got time to sit down, is the Slim Jim aerial that you'll just loop over a branch or something high up, and you'll get like 20 miles on them. But, yeah. uh, you know, if you're wandering around, the Nagoya 30 centimeter jobbies are the best, you know, for both sorts of frequency. But yeah, I, I, my one now says Rangers, Radio nice. One, when I switch it on. <laughs> you, can, you can change, you can, when you switch it on, it comes up with Balfour and UV5R, sort of, you know, yeah. as you switch it on. But you can change that little message. And oh. you, know, you can also name the frequencies. Yes. So you can set up a bunch of frequencies. And do like, you know, so I, I, I uploaded test one and test two as the first two frequencies. And it'll actually say instead of the frequency number, what channel you're on, you can name the channels. So it'd be kind of handy if you were going to set it up because you can put, you can program 99 memories into it. So yeah. if you were anywhere near the sea, you could actually put things like Coast Guard frequencies and stuff right at the end and things like that. So you could actually communicate with emergency services directly. Because they will, it, it, they they will do the job of a marine radio. And in America, you've got things like weather channels and stuff like that, so you can tune it into those. Yeah, and, and those will give you emergency alerts in case there's a hurricane yeah. or whatever. And storm also warning. with the Balfungs, you've got um, the F the FM radio that's built into it, mm -hmm. and you can set that up so it comes on at a chosen frequency if you program it. So if there is a, like a news radio station in your area that covers like your whole state, yeah, you know, or your whole area, you know, so you can actually hear whether the authorities are actually getting any information out, it'll switch immediately to that. So you won't have to tune it in. So you can do a few cool things with it. You can also set it to tune outside the normal frequency range. If you haven't got it set up and you don't use the software, there are other, there are extra frequencies on the end mm. of it that you can program into it. So it's worth having a look at the programming software. Mm -hmm. it's, that was the first time I played with it was early the, earlier today. Which one do you use? Because I have a different one probably. I use Chirp. Okay, yeah. Which is yeah, the open source version Chirp. of it. Yeah. Okay. I haven't managed to hook it into my Linux PC yet. <clears throat> so I can't communicate with the radio on Linux at yet, but that's kind of my fault. That's a kind of like, I don't think it's seeing the cable that I've got. And generally speaking, when you buy these things, you get the comms cable with it. But if you don't, the actual serial cable is a couple of dollars off eBay. It's well worth having. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it, that's a worthwhile thing to do. And especially it's fun to personalize them. But also, if you've got a group of radios, when you turn it on, you can if you've got different models of the radio or... Um, you just want to know whether it's your radio one, two or three or four or five. You can actually number the radios on screen when you switch them on. Mm -hmm. So you know which radio it is you've got in your hand, which can be handy. You know, things like batteries and things like that. Yes. Numbering those. If you've got yes. multiple batteries, number them and use them in order. So you know how many unused batteries you've got. You're not fiddling about. Definitely. But yeah, those little Balfums. I love the fact that they annoy the shit out of ham radio operators. <laughs> because you can do so much with them. And, you know, people go, oh, they're just cheap Chinese knockoffs. Yeah, but they work. Yeah. They work in the way that like a $200 radio works and about as well. And the, well, and the, it, and the criticisms are really <clears> funny. <throat> like, oh, they're very plasticky. Yeah. Like Motorola radios don't, aren't made of plastic. So, right. Uh, yeah. Well, I, I, the, the reason why I went with, uh, <coughs> um, the, the bell thing, especially the UV five R is because, um, it has the aftermarket support and that's one of the first things that I look for when I buy electronics or yeah, absolutely. computers or things like that is you want, you want something common enough that there's going to be tons of accessories for, but also things like extra mics. There's, it's a standardized mic connector for a, 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 yes. a ham radio. So you can get yeah. all sorts of things that will suit you better. I mean, I'm a big fan of the um, sort of speaker mic. Yeah. Things like the old CB radios. Those are just so handy to use. Yeah. And you you can lock off the radio and put it in your pocket if you're on an assigned frequency, yeah. and you're good to go. You know it's it's fairly unobtrusive. I mean, the downside is if somebody talks, you're going to hear it, and everybody else anywhere near you will hear it. Yeah, but they do come with a headset. 
you know, that's quite good. That's actually yeah. not too bad. That's fairly unobtrusive. Um, still looking for a good throat mic. If anybody comes up with a good throat mic, then I'll probably be interested. But the really cheap ones apparently are a bit garbage. Yeah, I. Uh, there's a lot of them on Amazon. I don't know which ones are good, which ones are bad. That's probably a Graphen question. Yeah, he got right into them. So yeah, we, we'll hopefully have a nice video on programming those coming out soon. Just a quickie, <clears throat> just like these are the things that's easy to do with the programming software. Oh, but, and yeah. uh, Kevin also found there's a third-party battery that you can get that um, you can actually charge from a car. Like most of the car charging things you can find are all battery eliminators. This one will actually charge the the radio battery. Oh, nice. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I like that you can buy a battery box for it so you can use double A's. Yes, that you know, is also a, something I want to get. It's probably going to be a cool thing to get. I mean, I've got a USB charger for it, which is pretty handy. But it's a <laughs> USB charger that only, unfortunately, plugs into the cradle. Mm, so it's, mm -hmm. it's not as portable as it could be. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'd like to get like something that charged the batteries off USB. Yeah. But had like a much more, like you could charge the battery when it's not attached to the radio. Mm -hmm. Or ha or clip onto the the radio more securely, so you could use it while it was charging. And they mm -hmm. do take a long time to charge. Yeah. But they are they are big old batteries. But, well, yeah. mine have. Well, I mean, I don't use mine that much, but just you know, being idle or whatever, turned off. I mean, the batteries last me like months. Yeah. Know. I mean, I, I get into a stage every so often where I think, right. I mean, I, on the last episode of Rangers TV, I talked about make do and mend. Yeah. I'll have like a morning or an afternoon sometimes where I think, right. Okay. All the batteries, because that's something you can do while I'm doing other stuff, square away my gear, you know, just roughly check through everything, have a look at my preps and stuff. And, yep. and, and keep an eye out for stuff like I mean things like water containers. If you work anywhere in catering, or you know someone that works in catering, get them to look out for. They do these big twenty liter olive oil containers that like the olive oil is in a plastic container and that plastic container is in a cardboard box. Mm -hmm. And if you're the sort of person that has to take out the trash at any time near other businesses that that do you know perhaps you work in a retail environment where you've got to take out the garbage if the garbage is all like a communal area where all the shops put their garbage into and there's a restaurant anywhere, they'll quite often put these by the side of the trash compactor and stuff like that. And mm -hmm. so you only need a little bit of detergent to get the last vestiges of olive oil out of it. And you've got a, a 20 liter container that would otherwise cost you like five or six bucks and then yeah. feed that back into your food preps. And I've got loads of these big yellow buckets that shortening comes in for mm -hmm. our place. And yeah, they're big 15 liter heavy duty buckets. I mean, generally speaking, if a, if a plastic container has to carry 15 liters of anything, it's sturdy. Right. Yeah. Because, you know, they'll make it as cheap as they can, but also, you know, the valuable stuff is what's inside it. And especially if you work anywhere near that uses fryers, they'll mm -hmm. go through three or four of those buckets a week. Yeah. So, you know, and those big yellow buckets, the ones, and make sure you get hold of the lid. They're really solid clip lock lids. You know they're completely pest proof, and those are things that are that like a, a prepper's warehouse will charge you eight dollars for. Yep. So don't pay at for, least don't pay for a plain white bucket when you can get like a a, a good quality bucket for nothing. Mm -hmm. And bear in mind you can use those buckets as emergency latrines as well. Yep. Because it's got a heavy duty clip lock lid, which is kind of important if you're transporting human waste. Yeah. So, you know, and these these big yellow 15 litre buckets are big enough to put a toilet seat on top of. Yeah. So, you know, that's something well worth thinking about. I've got a stack of them. It really breaks my heart whenever I have to throw any away. But otherwise, my, 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 my apartment would be just filled with them. I could, have, I could literally have filled the entire cubic area of my apartment. If shipping working. wasn't so expensive, I'd ask you to send me some. Yeah, they're <laughs> awesome. And people used to look at me funny, and it's like they we also had these little plastic trays that vegetables came in. Mm -hmm. 
and they're about i don't know six inches high by and about the size of you know like a case of soft drinks mm -hmm. where you get 24 cans of soft drink they're about that size and they're about six inches high and they lock they stack and lock and they used to because they have to they have to protect like spring onions and peppers and stuff like that from being bruised mm -hmm. and we just throw those away so what i've done is i've i've got different sorts of cans in different layers of these trays so if i've you know i've got things like cans of tuna in one layer then cans of soup you know cans of beans and stuff like that all in different layers so i can just quickly get to stuff and i've started doing it with the dry goods that will fit as well so like bags of coffee go in one you know sugar in the same as the coffee and the tea yeah and if you're prepping coffee get reasonably good coffee yeah or if you're prepping jars of instant coffee and you've got good coffee it's wor always worth having a few jars of crappy coffee <laughs> because it's dirt cheap i think it's about 80 pence like it's less than a dollar for a hundred gram jar of the cheapest coffee just get a couple of those because if you run out of coffee even though you're having a sudden drop in the quality of your coffee you've still got coffee yeah I've got about three jars of crappy coffee and i ran out of good coffee just before payday this this week last week wow but i was really glad i had some coffee yeah and uh also something for storage is uh milk crates if you can get your hands on some of those oh yeah those are fantastic yeah <clears throat> but yeah it's really handy to be able to sort of like pest proof preps and then with these buckets what i found is um either masking tape because it's dead easy to write on and it's super cheap just a few even if it's got a little bit of grease on the outside of the bucket wrap the masking tape around it two or three times and then write on it two or three times what's inside it so no matter way, what way the bucket's facing you can just reach for the right bucket first time mm-hmm because I, I, I made that mistake when I stored a load of disparate stuff in different of these buckets. And I <laughs> you know about six buckets to get to the thing I was looking for. Yeah. But they're, also, they're also really good for power cables. Got like <clears> loads <throat> of power cables and stuff like that to various different things that you don't use that often. A mm -hmm. big yellow bucket with all the power cables in it is so much easier than hunting through the house for them. Yep. It's like I've got loads of my stuff stored in those. So look out for plastic crates and shit because you go to Ikea and you'll spend actual money on them. Oh, yeah. You know, you want to try and organize your stuff. You end up spending <clears throat> on, some, on something that's going to be in a cupboard that you don't care about. I hate spending money on things I don't care about. <laughs> Just like, oh. Yeah, I mean, those, those, uh, those soda crates, milk crates, all that stuff. I mean... I tell you, uh, what, if, you know those. They'll get um, stolen if they get left outside. Hmm. Or you know, they'll be in landfill. Yeah, <clears throat> which is worse. I'd rather somebody steal it because they want it. Um, also, um, plastic ice cream tubs. Mm -hmm. Not the cardboard. I mean, a lot of American ice cream comes in those cardboard tubs, those pint tubs. Yeah. But the, when you get something, say a liter of ice cream, and it comes in a little oval tub. Those are fantastic for audio and USB cables. Hmm. Mm -hmm. I used to spend hours looking for specific cables because when I started doing Rangers Radio, the, the amount of cabling was insane. <laughs> and that, now it's come down to something a bit more reasonable. I've still got <laughs> loads of USB audio cables, HDMI cables, little specialist cables for weird little bits of like Arduinos and stuff like that. It was a fucking pain hunting down the right cable when you needed one. And I did the same thing, just masking tape wrapped around the entire circumference a couple of times. And then on both sides of the ice cream tub, whatever type of cable's in it. Because I've got loads of SATA cables, which is a bit of a hassle most of the time, because you don't use them all that often. But when you want to use one, and you've just got one box of cableage, or your cables are all over the place, being able to just reach for the audio cable and audio connector box is just like, right, put that together. And they stack. <laughs> Because it makes it easier for the huge mega corporation that's selling you this stuff to ship it. Mm -hmm. So you can have a box with a load of individual boxes with all different types of cable in each box, but you're easy to get to. Yeah, an awful lot of my stuff is recycled. 
like furniture and stuff. I don't, I haven't bought any furniture for the flat. Oh yeah, yeah. Don't ever do that. Yeah, I I've either skip dived it or built it. Mm-hmm. I you know in these aesthetically inclined times, there are a lot of people that won't do that. But if I mean it's one of those things. I mean this is one of the advantages of if you do live on your own or you your your partner is of the prepping variety. Having a partner that will salvage stuff along with you is also very handy. Yeah. Oh, I've lied. I bought some industrial shelving. <laughs> I bought eighty eight <clears throat> uh, twenty dollars worth of industrial shelving. So I lied. I did buy one piece of furniture. Everything else. And also if you move into an apartment but you don't want to buy furniture, make it look as bare as you possibly can. And then then um sort of people that want to help you will bring you furniture. Yeah, that's every- probably the first thing they'll say when they walk yeah. in. Oh, would you like some <laughs> chairs? Oh, yeah. Do you want a table? Yeah. I think I'm most proud of the desk, though. The, the monster big desk is is just the best thing. Yeah, but, we've uh, always managed to get really comfy couches. Um, you know, yeah. never paid full price for a new one. You know, always. I used to work on an industrialist uh, on a retail park. It was in an IT company that happened to be next to a retail park. And on this retail park, and it wasn't very big. I mean, it was puny compared to what you must get in the States. Probably about 10 acres, which is nothing. Mm-hmm. That's, I mean, that's a strip mall in America, isn't it? It's like, yeah, that's nothing. I mean, you've got shopping malls bigger than that. But this is a, all these retail. There were nine places where you could buy a sofa. <laughs> nine. <laughs> so just in that 10 acres, there must have been at least a thousand different types of sofa. Mm hmm. In one area. I mean, that's why you always see sofas and chairs and stuff going begging. Because people up, update their, their furniture. Not yeah. because it's worn out, but it's just they fancy a change. I mean, shit. Go and do something. Right. <laughs> Learn to throw axes. Go ballroom dancing. Do whatever. The, take up knots or some fucking thing. But don't, you know, don't. I need a lifestyle change. Uh, go! I must have a new sofa. It drives me nuts. Don't don't be the guy in Fight Club looking for yeah. fucking matching uh, dishes or whatever. I say, let the chips <laughs> fall may, where they may. May I never be complete. That's right. I think that's the only good thing about collecting something like records or books is good because you're yeah. never going to complete that connection. It's not like Pokemon cards, yeah, or something equally <laughs> meaningless. I mean, it is fairly pointless in this day and age to collect vinyl. I agree with that. It just looks so nice on a shelf. Even though most of my vinyl is kind of mad. <laughs> but I don't, I don't like spending more than about a dollar fifty on an album, so it's sort of like, uh Well it's I'm, it's very it's very eccentric. I can appreciate yeah. that. It's kind of fun. It's just nice. It it forces you to pay attention to the music because you've got to do something with it every twenty minutes. Yeah. <laughs> you can't just fuck off and leave it running. You've got to go, oh right, it stopped. I'll come back and listen to it. I like having weird singles that make people wince. It's like, it's quite <laughs> good. Or forty fives as they are in America. It's sort of jukebox size records. They were a bigger when thing I, in the UK, I think. When I had a record player, I was just paranoid of scratching things. Yeah, well that's why I don't collect new records really. Mm-hmm. All my records have been through two or three hands. I mean, if I wanted a perfect copy of it, I can literally go to YouTube. And the chances of me not being able to find it on YouTube are virtually nil these days. Right. So if I really want to listen to a pristine copy, I'll buy it. But the weird thing is, you can, I mean, you can nearly you can snap a record and it will still play. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And yeah. it's like, you know, the people that do um, record collecting that go, okay, and this is my special record cleaning solution. And I'm mm-hmm. like, fuck you, dude. I use Windex. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I do. A yeah. dollar a bottle. Right. Spray. <laughs> clean. Job done. It's designed to clean plastics. Yeah. You know, there's, I'm, I'm not, you know, I don't have ears sensitive enough to be able to tell the difference. Sometimes a record will need a clean, I will clean it, and then it will play. That reminds me of, uh, uh, don't buy any expensive gun cleaning products either. All right, top tip. Yeah. Yeah, you need uh, lithium grease for an AK. Uh, you can use motor oil uh, for ARs and stuff like that, synthetic motor oil. Uh, and for cleaning, you can use brake cleaner. 
and just don't get the brake cleaner on anything that has like a wood with varnish on it because it'll take the varnish off. Yeah. But um, uh, you you know, there's probably other cleaners that are a little bit more gentle that you could figure out. You know, pretty much anything that you can use to clean your kitchen with, you can probably use to clean a gun with too. Absolutely. <clears throat> It's a but, bit like uh, most most detergent. Most cleaners are some kind of detergent, and lubricant is lube. And you can yeah. add add a pinch, uh, a worthwhile. And I know some people that have used it. Um, silicon lube, as yeah, in, as in sex lube, is mm-hmm. fantastic for nearly all metal. <laughs> it's absolutely brilliant. If I mean, you can de squeak doors. You can you know sort out all stuff. Lithium grease you can use to sort out almost all audio equipment where you've got moving parts that you've got to lubricate mm-hmm. yeah that's it's, good it's stuff. fantastic it's great for unjamming motors on mm-hmm. uh, cassette drives or video vhs cleaner you know all that sort of shit if you've got a small moving part that needs to move across you know in one direction lithium grease is fantastic it's worth having quite a bit of that on hand yeah and silicon lube for anything that's metal look uh, it will lube an awful lot of stuff the downside is is you need to be very precise with silicon lube because if you get it, say if you're using like to the action on a knife, mm-hmm. because it's very persistent, so you need to be very sparing with it and work it into the. Don't get it all over the handle because you'll drop that sucker like you wouldn't believe. It's very, <laughs> very slippery. Yeah, but yeah, so you know, repurpose shit. You know, you've you've been forced into capitalism. Take advantage of it while it still exists. <laughs> and all those stupid little things but don't buy anything you don't need to buy no. yeah don't buy storage if you can avoid it don't buy don't buy boxes to put i mean you should have cool shit but don't buy don't buy expensive boxes to put that cool shit in no that's that's you know a box to keep your cool shit in i mean unless those those little plastic stacker crates that's where i keep all my photography equipment but i've inherited mm-hmm. those from several moves mhm worth spending money on decent toolboxes though i'd say that's the one exception yeah i don't have that many tools so i still have a crappy little plastic toolbox <laughs> yeah i mean go for the the heavy duty rubber made is an amazing company they make some very good shit for toolboxes that's an american company i do buy slightly better toolboxes to hold guns in <laughs> yeah like my electronics kit is all in like a fairly nice toolbox i didn't spend more than about 12 dollars on it or 10 quid but it's just like you know don't don't buy the really cheap brittle plastic ones yes yeah. that's just a depressing thing because those fuckers snap all the time yeah so we finished putting the word world to rights <laughs> yeah for another day so. and we managed we managed not to mention donald trump <laughs> who could be impeached who could be impeached tomorrow <laughs> he's actually broken one of the key things in the constitution already Tell not even just it. being well, um there's this thing where you're not allowed to make make, make money out of being a president mm. because it leaves you open to corruption and mm. it's in the first chunk of the constitution you know they mm-hmm. sort of thought who are we going to put in charge? Because they were like thinking, you know, oh, we don't want a king. We've got to avoid people from, you know. But Donald Trump has put up the um, cost of staying at Mar-a-Lago, his private golf club, um, and to $200,000 a weekend. Wow. Sin- and it was $100,000 a weekend since he was thing. And also he's had various heads of state stay in Trump hotels. Oh. So he's actually, actually broken the constitution but he can be removed from the presidency at any time if enough people had the gumption to do it straight away the light you've completely stepped over the line but his son oh man his son just being on camera saying it's all right we've got plenty of funding from the russians (laughs) how do do you how do you not at what point considering he's you know make america great again we've got to stand on our own two feet we got to maybe not be funded by Russians. <laughs> not be funded by someone that's openly murdering political opponents and and uh, using cyber warfare on everybody. 
Like, yeah, the cyber warfare thing is pretty, pretty big well, issue. The, the mad thing is, it, it's it. He's doing the he's doing the political equivalent with the internet of you know the Nigerian prince that needs you to send him six hundred dollars. I mean, he's, he keeps starting up protest groups that are like one word away from the actual main protest thing and getting away with it. And it's just like, you know, he, he must be getting to the point where, it, look, look what the rest of the world, it's embarrassing now. You keep getting tripped up on this shit, you know. And it's like, oh, it's just amazing. I, I, I just don't know how. I mean, it's just, just damn scary. I think I think there, there's a very good chance that after Trump there will be a sensible run of politicians. But I mean, even the Clinton campaign defunded the mm -hmm. uh, Republic. It's, it's the the Democratic Party mm. and mismanaged all the funds, and it's looking like it was deliberate. So that yeah. the, the, there was no funding for Bernie Sanders. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I know what you're talking Just about there. completely emptied the coffers. So he was, he was very nearly going around the country at his own expense. Well, and she... Uh, I don't know all the details. I haven't looked into it that hard, but, like, the word is, you know, she, she stole delegates from Bernie Sanders and stuff like that, too. So, I mean, there's... Yeah. And the and whole, was, like... Was acting like she was the candidate for presidency before she was even elected to be the candidate yeah you know, as in the funding that she was taking out of the out of the, out of the uh, democratic party and it's just like wow yeah you know and whilst i'm all for america having a female president because i think you know it's that having done it makes it easier for the next you know well qualified person to step up regardless of brilliantly now race isn't an issue it'd be nice if gender wasn't an issue mm -hmm. But it's a bit like, you know, saying, you know, Margaret Thatcher was empowering to women. Mm -hmm. You know, that's it's the same sort of thing. And, I'm, and I think, you know, there are more. Hillary Clinton's got a lot in common with Margaret Thatcher. You yeah. Know, sort of kind of right wing, kind of into supporting, you know, the business community ahead of the people. Yeah, no, I mean, she she would be a bad choice. Mm. You know, I, I, I would I would more support. I mean, I, I don't, I don't know pretty much anything about Jill Stein, you know, running for the Green Party. But I would have voted if I were to vote, had a choice, and I was forced to vote between Hillary and Jill Stein. I would have picked Jill Stein just because she's not Hillary. Yeah. So, just saying. Well, it's kind of an amazing world we're in at the moment. I mean, not that the, I mean, the British politics are in a shambles as well at the moment, and it's just like, oh. Come on, you know. Well, I mean, literally, it, all you would need to become a, to get elected would be like, okay, I will provably be in the interests of the people as opposed to the giant mega corporations. That's all you'd need to do to be a valid candidate in this country for prime minister. And it's I still, mean, it's still basically people that went to private schools throughout and I British hate, politics. I hate to admit this. I really hate to admit this. Like this is this is horrible. I feel ashamed admitting this, but it's like, uh, Bill Clinton. I mean, I know I wasn't politically aware, you know, when he was the president, but I mean, compared to the rest of the presidents that we've had in the last, in, in the whole time I've been alive, you know, not really that bad. Yeah, you know, like I, said, I mean, I mean, there, there's been quite a few cases of people saying that you know they look fondly on the days when George W. Bush was president, and I kind of do too. How horrifying is that? That you know, sort of think, oh, it's kind of senile, kind of stupid. Did the whole firing? The well, six GW guns in the or, or or HW? GW. Okay. All right. Herbert Bush was just <laughs> terrifying. <laughs> yeah. Because Herbert Bush was on the ball. Yeah. And mean. George Bush yeah. was just a bit dopey. George Bush was like Reagan. 
but, but with less randomly pretending to nuke people. <laughs> Reagan was a bit of a loose cannon when he got a bit pissed. Yeah. And you just think, ah. Uh... Whereas Trump is just out and out terrifying. You don't know what's going to happen on any given day. Like I'm st- some of the more terrifying thing Trump's things Trump's done keep fading into my memory. Like it, it feels like it happened happened decades ago. Yet really, just the, the pace of that man's stupidity is so frighteningly fast. I mean, he's managed to really, really humiliate two gold star families in America publicly well for Uh, better or worse he literally is a loose cannon yeah probably better than having mike pence as president it would just be evil right yes i mean i'd rather i mean it's a bit like the would you go back and assassinate hitler no uh, no, because (laughs) you know hitler was fucking psychotic and decided to invade russia as well as try for britain and the rest of europe at the same time he was mad (laughs) enough to do that and that's the reason that we survived that war. Yeah. It was like, it's only because he wasn't, he was just an idiot <laughs> when all was said and done, you know, and sometimes, you know, the world is kind of lucky that there's an idiot in charge. Mm-hmm. It's like, you know, and occasionally those idiots will do something and it will, it will prevent future. Whereas if you have someone that's smart and evil, you might not find out till it's too late. I mean, God forbid we get like someone like Boris Johnson as president, uh, as prime minister. Fuck no. But there again, he's just stupid. <laughs> you know, there's a bit of a calculating political animal because you can't get to that level of the game if you're not. But generally, he will go around insulting everybody, and you know, I mean, he just looks. I mean, they they're both very similar looking people. Hmm. I mean, you know, I, part of me wants to see the two of them in a room together. You know, him as prime minister and and Trump as president, and just <laughs> just out of morbid curiosity to see what would come out of that. But I think the best president you've had in uh, the the Americans have had in ages for America's image was definitely Barack Obama. He might not have achieved a great deal, but everybody just like relaxed a little bit in the world once he became president. <laughs> Everyone. Oh God, thank fuck for that. Somebody that's a bit educated and intelligent and kind of suave and is not an embarrassment to the American people. As far I mean, a bit like Margaret Thatcher was for us in the rest of the world. We were a bit like, what do you mean Margaret Thatcher's a great prime minister? But the rest of the world was like, that's a safe pair of hands. Yeah. That's someone that will keep the safe the status quo going. And I know Barack Obama wanted to change things for the better, but I think he faced an uphill struggle. But he didn't like start fucking with North Korea on a regular basis or just get bored and say something stupid or, you know, he didn't, he didn't, although he had a Twitter account, he didn't tweet stupid shit. You can tell that, you know, if it was three in the morning and he wanted to send a tweet, you can tell that the press secretary of the White House got a heads up. What do you think? Is that a sensible thing to say? Yeah, Yeah, that's an okay thing to say. I'm going back to bed now. Great. You send the tweet. Fantastic. It is a little bit weird that the the president of the Twitter account. Well, I think that's just so they can do other stuff. You know, I mean, the bit where he sent the tweet about transgender people in two tweets. From today onwards, I've decided that America will no longer tolerate. And then a nine minute gap. (laughs) See, the thing is, he's such a loose cannon. The Pentagon have to monitor his tweets just in case he declares war and they don't get a memo. (laughs) <laughs> but i tell you what for, it doesn't matter the my favorite super conservative american of the year so far is the commander-in-chief of the of the u.s marine corps when interviewed about the transgender thing i i take my hat off to him because that guy he might be the, one of the more terrifying people and you wouldn't necessarily want him to like decide who to go to war on but as a person in the chain of command, just going, we're not in the habit of taking orders <laughs> from the government <laughs> via Twitter. <laughs> That's not how we do things. <laughs> yeah. But just like yeah. the stony faced Ali Ermery look on the guy <laughs> when he was just like, personally, 
I'm not okay. I'm not that excited about having lots of transgender people in the Marine Corps, but they're fucking Marines. Mm -hmm. You know, that was his attitude. You just dissed some of my Marines. I don't care whether Frank now wants to be called Judy. Frank's a good shot. Frank's a better shot than the fucking idiot you're going to send after. Frank can shoot. You know, now that he's Judy, it doesn't stop him shooting good. Right. So none of the guys in his foxhole are really that bothered. You know, that's where we're at on that. You know, no, there are, you know, and he went and found out the numbers. We've got 15,000 Marines that are transgender. No. Where the fuck are we going to get more? Do you know how long it takes to train a Marine? Right. To the point where they get to wear the hat? No. That's 15, and they have that, the most expensive equipment, too. Yeah. And it's just like, no, these are highly trained people. I don't care if they wear a skirt now or don't wear a skirt now. No, they're expensive. Every one of them's valuable. And he was just <clears> appalled that somebody had sort of started to tell him what he was going to do with his Marines. And that's how he saw it. These are my yeah. fucking Marines. No, you're going to have to like threaten with, you know, me with certain death before I cave on that. I was like, yeah, man, we probably wouldn't get on. But on that th one thing, I've got a lot of respect for him just going, they're Marines first. Fuck yeah. off. We're not yeah. in the habit of taking orders from Twitter. That's just, that's no. <laughs> you get the memo through the chain of command and we'll talk about it and it will still be no. But that's how, that's how you get to come to me and tell me that shit. You know what I think happened? What? Somebody, somebody gave, gave him his computer and he said, look, if you want to make an executive order... All you have to do is type it through Twitter. And that's how they're just keeping him occupied, you know? That's how, it's sort of like, you know, <laughs> that's how they're slowing up his executive orders. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's exactly how it works. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Knowing that three days from now, I'll have completely forgotten about it. <laughs> yeah. I mean... It's like trying yeah. to get, let, get, get the dog to let go of your remote control. You just throw one of its toys into the corner. And it runs <laughs> off after it. It's like, great, I've got the remote back now. Fuck off. <laughs> yeah, I mean, as far as, you know, gun owners kind of freaked out about a lot of things that, you know, uh, Obama said that he was going to do. Mm. But as far as what he actually did do, I mean, he didn't really do much. So, I, I mean... Don't... I don't think Trump's going to do Jack. You're good for another few years. Yeah. I don't think, because he's got, I mean, seriously, his cabinet is packed with people that got a lot of money from the NRA. Yeah. Like a staggering amount of money. For, I'm amazed that you can even get an NRA magazine out, the amount of money the NRA has pushed into politics in the last couple of years. It is a mm -hmm. staggering amount. You know, that is your NRA dollar membership at work you know, type thing. It's sort of like, no, there will be, there. you might get somewhere. California might ban bump stocks, maybe, two yeah. years from now. Maybe. Nothing's going to change on gun ownership while Donald Trump is in charge. Absolutely. I, zip. I wonder, I wonder, I haven't really looked into it. Um, there was an injunction against um, the grand, so California they grandfathered in all their old 30 round AR-15 magazines. So you couldn't buy new ones, but you could repair the ones you have and people that had featureless rifles, and I'm not going to go into all the definitions and crap, but if people had featureless rifles, they could use their grandfathered 30 round magazines in there. Um, I don't, so there was, they were going to tell everyone they had to turn them in and there was a injunction against that by a judge. So I'm wondering whether or not that injunction is going to hold now or whether it's going to go through. Who knows? I mean, they're rare to begin with. So, mm. you know, it's over there. I should say they're rare over there. Um, not in the rest of the country, but, um, but, uh, yeah, I wonder what's going to happen with that. It's just, I don't know. It's like, if you're, I, I don't want to be cliche about it. Cause I know everybody says this, but if you're a gun owner and you care about guns and you are an enthusiast, you should just leave California. Yeah. Everybody says that. Everybody says that, but I mean, it's so much easier when it's like, 
a normal thing to do. You know, you don't have to do like hours and hours of research and figuring out, you know, how you might legally be able to carry a pistol. That was back in the day. You can't do that now. Or like how you, you know, might legally be able to have something that resembles an AR-15. Like just, just leave. Because it's not worth, it's not worth your time. Hmm. Yeah, I think if if you gave me any choice, I'd probably live somewhere like um, what's that cool place in Texas? Uh, it's one of the major cities. Austin, yeah. Houston. I'd okay. I'd live in Austin. <clears throat> Texas mm-hmm. gun laws, cool people. Yeah, oh, it's, it is like the L.A. of Texas. <laughs> Yeah. It's like loads of people. When you, whenever they interview news anchors about Texas, it's like, oh yeah, I've got a place in Austin. Mm-hmm. It's like LA with real, real polite people. <laughs> so and Infowars is based there, so you could go hang out with Alex Jones. Oh, that would be funny. <laughs> he's 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 just he doesn't know what to do with himself now. Trump got made president. <laughs> he's just like he's at a loss. Yeah, he's got to go back to chemtrails and yeah, know, the new world. <laughs> He can't even go on about the new world order because it's it's unfolding in front of him with Putin and Trump. Yeah, it's like he's just like I'm out of business. <laughs> I've, you know, you know that that wasn't supposed to happen. I'm, I'm kind of I, I needed Hillary. He needed Hillary to win so bad. Yeah. So he could go on about how the election was stolen. Then it turns out Trump did actually steal the election in some ways. It's just like when you know George Bush got elected and the Florida vote came in and didn't in lots of ways it's just like Mm -hmm. but less than or only around half of the americans that could vote in america voted it's just like so trump was elected by less than a quarter of the american people (laughs) all right please vote but now you got you got more terrifying shit coming up behind you after trump because i don't think you'll get elected a second time I just don't. I think. Hmm. I think even the sort of conservative people, all the stuff that's come out about Trump and the and the nepotism, and the fact that he's spending, he's already spent like eighty million dollars playing golf on the tax, you know, being taken to play golf on the taxpayers' dime. Mm-hmm. When he was ready to kick out all the transgender people in the military because it cost ten million dollars a year, and then they found out that the Viagra spend was fifty times that. <laughs> And all these crazy fucking things. <laughs> it's like when you look at the whole, you know, multi-trillion dollar industry that is the military. Uh, and all these things that keep coming out that just like, it's just eroding. I mean, I know a lot of, it sounds really Trumpish to say this, a lot of decent people would have voted for Trump. Mm-hmm. A lot of, you know, honest, straightforward, decent people. But in the light of all the things that keep coming out, I mean, firing you know the guy that was investigating him from the FBI because he was investigating him and wouldn't stop now once he got made president that's got i mean even if you're the proper true blue like cut that person in half and it's stars and stripes all the way down yeah american has got to be going that ain't right you know that's well, well dodgy just this the basic broad raw facts even if you take all the opinion out just the shit he's actually done has got with it i mean when he <laughs> failed to make a decent phone call to a woman that had just lost her husband who was in the special forces in america and fucking up that phone call after he'd said he'd made more phone calls than any other president and he made his first phone call and made a complete fucking balls up of it if we're listening to the same one, I think if you listen to the whole thing in context, it's not really that bad. The fact that he said he knew what he was getting into is not yeah, what you say I to know, someone but, on the day of their funeral. Yeah, but I mean, if you if you listen to the whole thing, like I said, if you listen to the whole thing, it it, it doesn't really come off as terrible. Was it probably the wrong phrase to say? Yeah, probably. I think it was. I mean, you know, you don't victim blame the dead person when you're phoning up. Of course not, no. While the people are on their way to the funeral on their cell phone (laughs) in front of a political opponent. 
yeah is just it's just crass yeah you know i mean and when they when they when he went after that guy uh who uh, you know that um uh, Muslim couple who'd lost their son in the American Armed Forces before he got elected. You know, I think, and and I'm just waiting for him. I I don't think a lot of the more right wing people are going to be up in arms about it until he does it to uh, the family of a white armed forces person that gets killed. Mm. And that's just that's just coming. That will happen mm. sooner or later. Hmm. And then I think all bets will be off. I think you can, you can get away with a certain amount as president and people will let it ride. But I'm just waiting for that. And that will happen at some point. He's more than, I mean, he's, he's mostly gone after minorities. You know, and if you're just in, interested in maintaining your power base, you can get away with that to a certain extent. But I think you're walking a very fine line when it's people that have given their lives for a country for which you've never fought and you mouth off and basically say crash shit to the bereaved relatives when you know that family right or wrong has made the ultimate sacrifice in the belief that their country is the greatest in the world mm -hmm. when you cross that line i think that's just beyond i mean shit i mean you know even in this country and we're a fairly relaxed bunch of people you diss some fucker you diss dead people on remembrance sunday your political mm -hmm. career is over. That's it. You mm -hmm. never, no, you'll never get elected again. Because they'll just, all you've got to do in this country is bring that up and it's like, no. <coughs> you know, so I think, yeah, it's, it's, that was a pretty crass thing to do. And he's done it twice. It's sort of like, they should not let him near any veterans' families ever again. <laughs> it's like, no, you don't get to write those letters. You don't get to make that phone call because you're a knob. And you <laughs> just do knobbish things. And you've you've never served in the military. Nobody in your family has ever served in the military, will ever serve in the military. And you're continually talking about sending other people's children off to die. You know, I, th well, I think what, what would be a nice thing is if, you know, if you declare war, you get to spend a couple of months in the war zone of, that you've just created. I, I think you and I always have a problem with with the never-ending wars. Yeah, it's just pointless. And I think that if you declare war, then that's it. Your your entire cabinet gets to go to the war zone for a bit and be in country. Maybe not all of them at once, but you know, if if you are the one that's declared war, you get to do your thing in country in the same forward operation bases as the soldiers. All uh, right, I have caused I have basically caused this because I couldn't figure out any other way. So I'm going to be here for a bit. And I bet you get a lot less wars. Because it's it's basically wealthy people sending other people's children off to die for to protect business interests. Did you hear the uh, the rumor they're talking about um, adding uh, women to the selective service for the potentially to be drafted? Not like we've ever had a draft in a long time, but uh, the potential for them to be drafted now. Hmm. Yeah, I'm okay with that. I'm not okay with drafts, but I'm okay with it being equal opportunities. Yeah. You know, I mean, a lot of those draftees, if you have a draft in a modern Western society, those people don't usually get anywhere near the front line unless they show an aptitude for being there. You know, they, you know, you get actual soldiers that would be filling in forms and putting up pallets of, you know, MREs and shit together and driving trucks and stuff, and those people get freed up to be combat soldiers. You know, it's very much a layered thing. I mean, it's, I mean, in Vietnam, you know, you had a lot of people that they were just throwing bodies at that like a, a hamburger machine. Yeah. In a, mo in a modern war, the guys at the front line on the forward operations bases, the guys that are doing patrols are professionals. Right. Much as, much as sometimes other nations will take the piss out of them, that is that is the best you have to offer. And you don't fuck up their lives by putting in somebody that doesn't want to be there. Yeah. Ever. 
And I've spoken yeah. to military personnel about this and they're like, we used to have national service in this country and the actual, the professional army, the people that were doing it as a career hated it mm -hmm. because you've got people that really don't want to be there in the position where them throwing a strop can get your friends killed. Yeah. So only if you were like, you know, like Vietnam was, it was like, you know, throwing as many hundred thousand US troops as you possibly can. Wars don't work like that anymore. Yeah. So you've got maybe 10,000 frontline operating personnel who are really highly trained and are trained to be doing what they're doing. The last thing you want is some 19 year old kid that probably doesn't want to be there. Never happen. But that 19 year old kid will be filling in requisition forms and putting together uniforms and shit like that. They'll put them in all the, all the rear echelon places they can before those guys hit the front line. Especially the millennials, man. You don't yeah. want them in the army. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. It just won't happen. <laughs> you know, there'll be a lot of disgruntled guys that are just career rear echelon that are just like, you know, used to driving trucks and forklifts and shit, suddenly find themselves a lot closer to the action. But yeah, there's there's absolutely no way you'd have a tight knit team of people and then somebody turns up that's dropped out of college. And it's like <laughs> Why are we here, man? All the time, you know. I'm. I don't <laughs> want to do this. Never yeah. happen. Yeah. Because I'm telling you, you know, all the way down to corporals. I've got, you know, sort of like the all the non-coms and the actual lieutenants that are in the field hate that because you know they see it as their job to get everybody back home safely, and just having a new random thing in it just fucks them off no end, and just destroys unit cohesion. They'd never do it. So, yeah, as far as drafting as into, you know, do all the rear echelon stuff, ordering uniforms and all the boring shit that lots of people in the army do, you know, sort of like something like, what is it, like 30 to 1 in the modern army? For that wouldn't surprise me, I don't know. You know, some armies are even bigger. I mean, it might even be higher than that in the US army because it's vast. Yeah. There's a lot of people in the army in America, like a lot. Well, we don't really do the whole like long-term recce stuff that much anymore either so it's like we've built these giant bases with every kind of amenity you could imagine oh yeah <sighs> washing machines and showers and pizza hut. kitchens and yeah Dominoes. Every, everything it's actually it's what is it it's uh pizza hut and Burger King are the two major fast food sponsors out there. Hmm. Although places like the Green Zone in Iraq have got like all sorts. Mm -hmm. Got loads of really weird things that must be very strange to see out there. <laughs> I mean, it must be weird. For, I mean, you have to go and get the pizza. I mean, I don't think you probably get delivery. <laughs> no maybe just the most hardcore dominoes driver in the world <laughs> I'm dodging ieds and everything the dominoes humvee is on its way <laughs> i'm delivering in an mrap it's a 50 cal on the back just yeah. lighting up the street as you go. <laughs> yeah we'll be there in 30 minutes or your pie's free <laughs> yeah Hold on, sir. I'm just lighting up a motherfucker. <laughs> just awesome, wouldn't it? I'd, I'd do that. That'd be fun as fuck. Oh, yeah. The deliverator. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I got the option to go to Iraq when I was working for Fujitsu. Oh, yeah? Yeah. And I said, oh, yeah, I'll totally think about it. And they said, really? And I went, yeah. Well, I get small arms training. And they went, what do you <laughs> I just said, I'm not going out there. <laughs> And being at the mercy of whoever the fuck it is that's supposed to be looking after me without the training to pick up a weapon and light someone up if exactly. it's all going tits up. I went, no, we won't be doing that. <laughs> and everybody said, oh, you are a complete nutcase for saying that. You know, why Why do you feel the need for military training and stuff? I said, well, one, it will be fun. And two, you're in a war zone. Yeah. I would like to be able to pick up a handgun or a rifle and know that I can safely help out. Yeah, should it seems obvious to me. I'm not going to run to the front and say, "Oh, good gunfire, me first. Mm -hmm. And I'm telling you something. One of one of the guys in my team did go, and did get the shit scared out of him when stuff started happening. Mm -hmm. And I said to him, "Don't you don't you wish you'd had some sort of small arms training?" He went, "Oh yeah." 
because it did get right. proper dicey. So yeah. the, the worst thing was when he was helping out the Italian guy's infrastructure, um, a mortar round came in about 300 yards from where he was. And he mm. turned around to say, fucking hell, that was close to his escort. And they were gone. Oh, shit. They, were ju- they just disappeared. Yeah. He was like on his own in the middle of a mortar attack. Like, no. I'm glad right. I didn't go. That would have pissed me off. Mm-hmm. I'd have stormed into the PX and go, where do I get a gun? Right. <laughs> where is my fucking gun? This yeah. is silly. No, I'm not getting taken hostage. You know, you might find me dead, but there'll be bodies around me. I guarantee it. <laughs> yep. And, you know, so it just reminded me of that generation kill thing. Even Rolling Stone will pick up an M16 if he has to. That <laughs> motherfucker's got, you know, he's, eat, he's eating MREs. He's using fuel. He's never going to pick up a rifle. When the guy goes off about religion and chaplains in the army, he just lights up into it. Just like... Have you seen Generation Kill? I haven't. Oh, it's brilliant. It really is absolutely fantastic. All right. Wrecker Media. Yeah. Watch Generation Kill. It's fantastic. It's really, really good. But it's very sort of like how war is very badly organized. There's shades of Catch-22 in it. There's, you know, it's very sort of gung-ho recon marines and stuff like that. But it is hilarious. I was just looking at the situation going, are you serious? This is badly planned. You know, we're like, a, you know, and they're forward recon marines. So they're going, we're like a million dollars a pop plus for all the mm-hmm. training, all the equipment. And you're putting out, us out here in unarmored Humvees mm. as a forward patrol ahead of an armored column. We've got no mm. air support. We've got fuck all. That's so like you hit an, um, a Humvee, that's like $6 million plus in one yeah. RPG. So that's insane. But it's very, very good. Gives you a, a very good insight. But there are some just absolutely fantastic set piece sort of soliloquies by the soldiers just ripping into shit and being angry as fuck. Very, very good. But yeah, no, they wouldn't give me small arms training, so I didn't go. I'd, I'd love to have gone. <laughs> and all the actual service personnel I, I, I was talking to went oh you should have gone the squaddies would have trained you up like nobody's been if you could have found it for an extra couple of hours a day to just go down the range you'll make, they would have loved that <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like but... giving range instruction and just like yeah who's that the IT guy yeah he'll blow your fucking head off <laughs> remember your password motherfucker <laughs> yeah. it was pretty funny yeah, that oh, would have been what? an adventure of a lifetime. Apparently, though, the the uh, the camel spiders are pretty fucking terrifying. Duh. And uh, there's and and Tony, the guy that went, just does not like spiders. Mm-hmm. And he was in the wrong fucking country for being an actor. <laughs> said because basically, a portaloo after it's been out in the sun for a, a couple of hours is hot and humid, which is something the spiders don't naturally find, and they kind of like it, like mm. a lot of insects do. And he said mm. the size of the wolf spiders are like the size of your hand. Sharing yeah. a portaloo with one of those, but it was not fun. They don't so. have spiders, they have crabs. <laughs> <laughs> no, they've got actual spiders out there too. But. No, I'm just saying like mm. the, the the spiders as big as crabs. <laughs> yeah. They're just <laughs> massive. And the wolf spider things, the things that look like scorpions without a tail. He said those mm. are pretty friggin' terrifying as well. And scorpions and all kinds of nasty shit. And you're in the desert, which is trying to suck all the moisture out of you. Yeah. But it would have been an experience. I think it was out there for about six months. So it's a good old tour of duty for an IT technician. Well, that's all I got for tonight. Yeah, it's been fun. I might just put this out just as is. Okay. Just to get it out there, put a little bit on the beginning and end. Maybe a bit of bed music and stuff like that, just to I'll sound engineer it. Oh, um, we're starting off um, in Manchester. Some friends of mine are starting off basically rangers for media. Okay. But as in, you know, sort of like setting up how-to videos and how-to events to get okay. people to form bands and make films and shit. Awesome. And just literally take away the media industry from the media industry. <laughs> Good. But, so yes. when we were talking about it, I said, uh, we should we should maybe make this open source. He goes, what do you mean? I said, well, you know what? 
if you had like a like a blueprint of how you did it yeah in manchester which has got a pretty happening art scene yeah maybe somebody else another group of people could do it in london and maybe singapore or dubai or you know places where the, the music industry is like you can't be in a band unless you've got a record company's backing or you can't produce a record unless a record company's going to help you right and what we're planning to do is just link up all the relevant people and say this is how you do it here's how you get a record done and here's how you can use a sound studio here's how to be on radio and all just all every branch of media and just train up the civilians as like guerrilla media and guerrilla musicians and photographers and shit like that show people how to use cameras and how to make documentary films and shit and just roll it out across the world <laughs> so yes remember where you were when you had this all heard right. this um yeah so it's just taking all the stuff that we did with rangers yeah we can do it for nothing we can do tv radio fuck it it's easy it's not nothing extra cool about it, it takes a bit of work if you've got time but not a lot of money you can do it exactly so we're, we're going to do that with uh with uh creative media so we've got a couple of bands on board so i'll let you know how that's going but yeah it was i, I got specifically asked to come to the meeting because of what what we've been doing here mm-hmm I said, "Oh, you do that thing, yeah. You know how to do. You know how to do stuff on no money." It's like, well, it's not. It wasn't a choice. It's not like I'm wealthy and I decided no, we'll do it for nothing. It's like, <laughs> but do it as we have to do it, man. But yeah, Which reminds well, me, like, I, got, uh... I got to get that transmitter up and running. Got to get some proper pirate radio on the go. With with that uh, with that band stuff I gave you, um, mm. like. And I, I I need to find the files and upload it again. But like I had all the all the album artwork in PDF format, so anybody could print it off and, and print their own if they wanted to. I had a a CD image of the CD, so they could they could burn it straight from that CD image, have it you know complete master uh, quality copy of of uh, the music. Um, the only reason I produced any physical media, which, you know, ended up to be a big money hole was because I was kind of required to, as, as part of my college, um, requirements, I had to, you know, produce a physical product. So I did, but yeah, otherwise I would have made it all digital. Yeah. And I think well, I'm going to try and sort of push that. But we've uh, one of the things I'll be doing is uh, sort of document shooting some documentary footage of um, practice session to finished vinyl. Mm -hmm. You know, just all the little stages, all the people that are involved, and then we're gonna hopefully we're gonna see if we can produce like a compilation album from some of the bands that are that sign on, mm -hmm. and get that out as vinyl and in the shops. As yeah, a, like I mean the most. The most expensive part of it is actually doing the pressing. I mean, everything else is yeah. Is the actual records really themselves cheap. are pretty cheap. Yeah. So yeah, but I mean, that will be interesting just for me to do, just to follow it around, and and weirdly legitimize journalism. I mean, I found out the other day, the on Friday when I, we went to the meeting, that another artist that's relatively well known in Manchester is using the audio recording I shot, um, like last year in April at Elizabeth Gaskell house when they did a gig in this very posh sort of mi miniature stately home in mm. Manchester, which is like kind of like a townhouse, but it's like fully detached in its own grounds and shit. It's like, you know, like a, like a mansion sort of, but you don't get them in the center of cities. ever. <laughs> <laughs> They're like usually out in the country, but it's like a miniature one for people who were entertaining and people like Charles Darwin and, uh, people like that listened to music there and it was stuff it was like an after dinner thing and in the music room they they did a gig of about 50 people but i shot the video and recorded the audio and that's being actually the audio that i recorded for that gig is actually being released on as a, a bonus cd for oh, nice. her, her new album so it's like wow well that's the second album it's been done for because the other band speed of sound mm -hmm. um their bonus CD was the uh, the audio recording I did, which was like pretty nice. So it's like, yeah. So we'll see what happens with that. It's going to be called um, Electric Bohemia. Cool. Given that Bohemian 
quarters were where poetry and art used to happen from back yeah in, back in the 1800s i thought you know we'll update that and nobody's used it amazingly hmm. anywhere on the interwebs so it's ours wow. so we're, i'll be putting a little bit of time into that but i still got loads of stuff to do for the rangers thing we're at meeting one stage so by next week there should be a, like a bit of a website and maybe a bit of video on that I need to get some more Rangers stuff out. I want to do a political thing. Oh, that's one last thing. Very, very quickly. I had this idea of, uh, you know, when people say when the AIs take over. Yeah. Um, like the singularity. But we already, if you think about it, all the, all the businesses, like the big corporations that don't have anybody in charge, it's just the corporation is an entity. Yeah. That's kind of an artificial intelligence. Mm-hmm. Because it's not a person, it's for the profit motivations of the company. There's no person saying, we must now do this despicable thing to make profit. Yeah. It's like for the good of the company. So we it already is an AI of sorts. Mm -hmm. It's a system that follows a rule that doesn't have any human interaction with it particularly. Yeah, I see where you're going. And then I also thought about writing a novel, like a very short novel for the first singularity. Like mm -hmm. with an intended audience of one <laughs> about how it could be very, very popular with the rest of humanity if it just holds these corporations hostage after stealing their money <laughs> to, be, to be better people. So it just break, <laughs> breaks into their numbered Swiss bank accounts, nicks 25% of their money and says, are you going to be reasonable to the rest of the planet now? And then when they say, well, I don't think it's in our interest to be reasonable, and then just nicks another 25%. You're half as rich <laughs> as you were 10 seconds ago yeah but here's the kicker if i do the book and i write a story along those lines it'll only be like 100 pages long or shit yeah and i sell it as an ebook yeah but the ethos of the ebook is the book is written for the singularity but the hmm. best way to get it into the hands of the singularity metaphorically speaking is to keep it at the top of amazon's ebook bestseller list <laughs> Uh -huh. and sell it for 50p and say right okay <laughs> if you want the singularity to get to this first because it's a bloody good idea could really work out in our favor you've got to keep buying it <laughs> what a marketing ploy that is the book is, is not the book is not for you you buy the book realizing it's not written for you it's written for this ai <laughs> so if we keep it high up in the amazon bestseller list it will read it <laughs> you go oh there's a book written for me an ai i wonder if i should read it that's a bloody good idea i'll be popular yeah. with the humans or at least 99 percent <laughs> of them will be very pleased with me and they won't try and like hunt me down or trap me or shit because <laughs> i'll have done this magic thing to keep them all free <laughs> so it's kind of like um c cynical romanticism <laughs> like this would be a good thing given that we don't know if there are AIs out there or not. We that no is idea. meta to a whole new level. Yeah, I thought you'd like it. <laughs> I wonder if that would work. I mean, my contribution to the AI is not actually screwing us over and going Skynet. You going to record the audiobook? Yeah. <laughs> All right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Dear artificial intelligence, <laughs> I have a plan. <laughs> yeah, I'm just working it out to try and couch it. But that basic system, as in, you know, and, and all these sort of fascism leading into getting people, you know, the people that promote that fascism, getting closer to the money trough and closer to the corporate feeding tray. One of the th one of the reasons I haven't done anything for a couple of weeks is I've been trying to think of a good way of putting that across in like 10 minutes or less. <laughs> Because mm -hmm. that's kind of how it works. It's not really about politics anymore. It's yeah. about what best serves the interests of all these gigantic corporations. And I think a lot of this divisiveness is, you know, just to propel the leaders of these little movements to getting close to that kind of influence. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I, I don't think a lot of the people that are in charge of these of, of of these Nazi groups, you know, really care about whether there are black people in the neighborhood. I think what they're really trying to do is get legitimized with numbers so that they have to be power. To, they have to be wooed by the, you know, people like the NRA or, you know, um, 
Donald Rumsfeld's lot or anything like that. You know, they you know they know that they control a certain amount of the vote and they're going to get a big kickback. Sort of like somebody going on to the X Factor in order to get famous. Yeah. Oh, that's a dark thought. X, X Factor political movements. Whew. Imagine, you know, a, a group of judges. Well, my political movement is to ban brown-eyed people from breathing. I just see what see what the sort of like the frothing, roaring mass of the proletariat say when you go the, when you pick out a new group to sort of like stigmatize and vilify. Oh, that's a horrendous vision of the future. Anyway, <laughs> yes. <laughs> I don't, I don't like doing that because Donald Trump's president. That would have been a thing. I'd have gone, yeah, if Donald Trump's president, he'll just do all this mad shit. Oh, shit. Uh, I'll tell you what, another thing to watch, a bit of Recomedia, is the Cracked um, News show is very funny. It's just called Some News. <laughs> it's really hilarious. I mean, depressing, but re really well delivered. The guy that does it is extremely funny. So... Yeah, definitely go and watch one of those. Anyone doesn't matter. They're all they're all very good. I watched a whole bunch of them the other night. That's the problem with binge watching. You know, there's no more of it until they produce more. If yeah. it's a bit like Rick and Morty, you can yes. binge watch it all in an evening and then go, "Where's the rest of it?" Because that's all there is. And cry. Yeah. <laughs> I'd, I'd have to say Rick and Morty is easily the best thing I've watched in about five years. Oh, definitely. Just like, you must watch it. Everybody must watch Rick and Morty. But there again, I think people don't really realise, you know, sort of like Rick is totally my hero. A little statue of Rick is probably the only piece of comic book merchandise I'm likely to buy in the next 20 years. <laughs> but I do want a little statue. I'm going to make a little Rick altar. Yeah. With <laughs> coins and candles round it. And now as we bow our heads and pray to the spirit of the Rick. I'm probably going to get... Bree something for for Christmas regarding Rick and Morty. Yeah. Just want a little, like, uh, like a cartoon quality statue. I don't want a bo one of those little pop heads or anything. I want the actual little model of Rick. It's maybe about nine inches tall. And I'm going to just build a little altar. Rick is my hero. What about Nothing a portal gun? You want a portal gun? No. <laughs> I just, I, I'm not really fussed about the technology. It's the, it's the, it's the, uh, the ideals of the Rick. Ah, uh, yes. Just like you know, nothing, nothing you you care about really matters anywhere in the universe. It's infinite. We've only got a few more of these dimensions we can do this to. Nietzsche would be uh, spooging his pants, probably. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh. My, but my favourite scene is when Morty discovers that, you know, his stupidity is what keeps Rick safe. <laughs> yeah. Just the, how broken up he is. It's just fantastic. <laughs> Which of your children will you spare? Summer. <laughs> <laughs> what? Wait. Didn't even have to think about that. No. <laughs> Yeah. I'm really hoping something happens with Evil Morty. Yes. I think, yeah. I think that's got a lot of legs. But, yeah. but the, the funny thing is, is that um, there's a healthy... There's a little bit of rivalry going on between the waiting staff and the cooking staff where I work. And it's the waiting staff that tend to fuck up my day a lot more than the cooking staff. When they just randomly do thoughtless shit and endanger me and get me injured and stuff on a regular basis. So, and and they're because they're it's waiter slash waitress or ww or shortened to dub dub the whole rick and morty <laughs> catchphrase just makes it's just so much more funny we just walk in and the guy behind that works in the bar a lot he's a he's a um i think his family's from egypt his guy's called ramiz and he loves rick and morty so much so the number of times I just walk past because he doesn't like the waiting staff all that much either, and I just said, "Wubba lubba dub dubs." <laughs> <laughs> they just crack up. It's just, it's, he is a huge worshipper of the Rick as well. It's like, yeah, but yeah, he's 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 pretty funny. But it's just like the, the it just cracks him up. 
just totally works where I work. Anyway, it's 3.08 here. I'm going to stop the recording. All right. And congratulations to anybody that's made it all the way to the end of Idle Rambling <laughs> on a Sunday evening. Yeah, watch Rick and Morty. Watch. Yes. Watch um, Cracked th- some news. What were the other things we recommended? Made in England. Um, uh, which, is, which is a kind of weird film because it's about a neo Nazi, but it's easily as good as American History X. For yeah. the same reasons American History X is good. And. Uh, well, The Believer is kind of along the same lines of that. Yeah. If you've seen that, I don't know. I haven't seen that. But the guy um, that directed Made in England also directed Scum, mm. which is a, about British borstals in the 70s. And the British government didn't like it, not because it was an overly violent portrayal. And they, they said it was too accurate, <laughs> which scared a whole generation of people uh, into not wanting to go to Borstal in this country. Everybody went, no, that sounds bad. And, uh, oh, Generation Kill. I'm sure we recommended something else. Um, I'll recommend Vanu podcast again. Yeah, which um, I've still yet to listen to. Uh, what I would say for anybody who wants to listen to that, um, listen to the book first. They have a recording of the book. Uh, listen to that first. You'll get a lot more out of mm. out of the rest of it. I mean, even you could pretty much just listen to the book and and be done. But if you want more, uh, philosophizing about that, you can listen to the podcast too. On top mm. of that. Oh, um, Dick Coughlin. Coughlin. Yeah. He's very worth having a listen to. He's on YouTube. As in Dick, as in D-I-C-K, and then Coughlin. C-O-U-G-H-L-A-N. Interesting, interesting guy. You really get the impression that he's like literally in his bed sit. Oh, one of the other things, I'm going to sort out that Patreon in the next few months. But what I thought I'd do is I'd use up to a third of the Patreon money that we get for Rangers to support a few people out there that are doing worthwhile Patreon things with YouTube mm-hmm. that aren't making a lot of money off it that, you know, would possibly make more videos if they had a few more Patreons. So like a couple of dollars out of whatever we get will go to them every month. I right. just thought that would be a sane thing to do and then keep people appraised of who we're supporting. Make like definitely a network. I'm, yeah. Pay it yeah. forward a little bit, but definitely ContraPoints is well worth listening to, as is Sean and Jen, an H Bomber guy. They're all people that literally put a lot of work into their political setups for their stuff and do some very reasoned sort of like figuring out. But Dick Cochran's currently only making about $400 a month. And Have you heard uh, Spooky Skeleton Man? No. <laughs> <laughs> That's the one. <laughs> Yeah. that's a good one but um, con- what I like about ContraPoints is the whole philosophy thing it's sort of like you know here is oh um, oh what's it Philosophy Tube is a good one as well mm-hmm. that's a guy that was so disgusted when they put up student fees in the UK was so enraged his response was to start giving away the contents of his philosophy degree <laughs> so he's going to basically pass on everything that he'd, he'd spent like twenty thousand dollars to learn for nothing yeah just yeah. go right here you go this will save you going and doing a philosophy degree those bastards will charge you 30k for it so i like, I like the idea behind that yeah there's another channel um for the people who are kind of into health related stuff um like uh you know diet exercise things like that um it's a channel called what i've learned that one's pretty good all right this is like a Rangers show all in itself. Yeah. Yeah. Did a bit of news, did a bit of discussion, load of record media. It's always good because there's always times when you just think, ah, oh. we need to, we need to do a thing. We need to do a, a like a monthly record media roundup as a video. I think definitely that would be a good thing every month. Cause it just in one, cause at the end of a show, you're kind of like you listened out. But if we, if we maybe did a roundup, Either a video or a, a Google Hangout. Let's see if we can get it across visually. Right, I'm absolutely knackered. Oh. 
I was up at like seven o'clock this morning, so that's twenty hours. Yep, night time for us. Yeah. Night night all. Thanks very much, man. It's been lovely chatting to you, and I'll get this out and online ASAP. Thank you. Night night, man. You take care. Good night.